Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure for me to welcome you to this event on transnational responses to kleptocracy, the role of transit and destination countries. We have a great program today for all of you. And without further ado, I'm gonna turn over to Scott Mastic, our Vice President for Programs. Good afternoon. Uh, it is a pleasure uh, to welcome uh, everyone to this timely discussion uh, today for this hybrid event on transnational responses to kleptocracy and the role of transit in destination countries. Destination countries meaning, of course, countries here in Europe and other industrialized countries. So, Russia's criminal war on Ukraine is putting into sharp focus the threats posed by authoritarian aggression in ways not seen here in Europe since the Second World War. Beyond the military invasion and footage of heinous war crimes, though, we know that Vladimir Putin's corrupt system of rule is made possible by a global network of allies and enablers that perpetuate his power and create conditions that allow, that allow for his invasion of a democratic country. In fact, kleptocracy is the backbone of authoritarian regimes. Transnational borders, uh, transcending national borders, kleptocrats use a myriad of tactics to amass wealth, consolidate power, and project malign influence. The Kremlin, and as well the Chinese Communist Party, have weaponized grand corruption as a tool of statecraft. They take advantage of weak accountability systems in countries to perpetuate predatory rule. Today's discussion will seek to unpack some of these issues to better understand and respond to this threat. This includes taking steps to reduce the ability of kleptocratic actors to use the international financial system to hide assets and launder the proceeds of corrupt acts. To do this, a sound evidence-based understanding of the symbiotic relationship between authoritarianism and kleptocracy is needed to help like-minded democracies push back and defend the international rules-based system. So today's event is hybrid. In addition to our live audience and speakers, we are joined by colleagues and kleptocracy watchers from both the US and Europe via Zoom. Some of the panelists are joining remotely and we will be monitoring Zoom regularly to ensure that we capture comments and questions from everyone. Our two panels today are It Takes a Network to Defeat a Network, Pushing Back Against Kleptocracy in Russia and Beyond, and the second panel, The Status of the Fight Against Kleptocracy in Europe. We will also present and discuss IRI's Kleptocrats Playbook, a framework for understanding the full range of tactics that corrupt leaders employ around the world. At the end of the program, for those joining in person, we're going to have a reception as well so that we can continue the conversation in a more informal setting. And this being Brussels, what would be a program without a reception at the end with some wine. Uh, a few quick words about IRI's approach to countering kleptocracy. So IRI has been around since 1983. Uh, with as many uh, of those uh, participating in Europe know, a lot of original institute work focusing on Europe's transitioning democracies at the end of the Cold War. Over the past two decades, IRI has implemented more than 75 anti-corruption and transparency programs in over 50 countries, assisting government officials and civil society alike in bolstering accountability and good governance. Through targeted anti-corruption programming, IRI has supported over 1,300 government officials and 400 civil society representatives, and we've reached more than 200,000 citizens worldwide. And through this work, IRI has identified gaps in anti-corruption efforts. To date, no single resource has cataloged the suite of both transnational and domestic tactics that klepto kleptocrats deploy to expand opportunities for public resource theft which incidentally is most often accompanied by suppressing civil society efforts to expose that theft. This evidence-based understanding of kleptocratic tactics is needed to empower reform-minded actors to anticipate, identify, and address wholesale kleptocratic strategies. And it is also needed by journalists and activists to better investigate and expose corruption. 
IRI's kleptocrats playbook is a tool designed to do exactly that. Based on extensive research, the guide outlines a taxonomy of kleptocratic strategies and the most effective ways to counter them. And we have copies of that uh, playbook uh, here today in Brussels uh, to pass out uh, as, as people may want to take them. Okay, so let me move uh, to our speaker introductions. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, two speakers for our first uh, panel today, Gary Kalman, uh, Director of Transparency International US and my colleague uh, to my left is Egyar Lizundia, who will be presenting IRI's Kleptocrats Playbook. Um, Gary oversees Transparency International's US operations, focusing on illicit finance and the role of the United States in global anti-corruption efforts. He is a founding member and executive director of the Financial Accountability and Corporate Transparency Coalition, a nonpartisan alliance promoting policies to combat the harmful impacts of corrupt financial practices. Previously, he also directed the Federal Legislative Office for the US Public Interest Research Group, where he was a leading voice for congressional ethics and lobbying reform. Egyar is IRI's Senior Advisor for Governance and Anti-Corruption at the Center for Global Impact at IRI. Uh, he leads IRI's efforts to counter corruption globally and served as the editor for the Kleptocrats Playbook we're discussing today. Uh, prior to IRI, Egyar worked in the public sector um, uh, management reform on management reform projects in Latin America and Africa at the World Bank. Uh, so with uh, my pleasure, I will now hand over the mic to Egyar to give his perspective on the global uh, on global kleptocracy and the IRI kleptocrats playbook. Egyar, floor is yours. Thank you so much, Scott. I'm delighted to be here and to have the opportunity to present on IRI's kleptocrats playbook and to share the metaphoric stage or the virtual stage with Gary Kalman. Um, for those in the room, please make sure to grab a physical copy of the playbook. We have a few copies on the table over there, but for those joining via Zoom, my colleague Anna Downs will be dropping in the chat the link to the electronic um, version of the document to make sure that you can also access it um, as well. The structure of this session is as follows. For the next 15 or 20 minutes, I will be highlighting the main components and the key um, contributions that we think these playbook um, makes. And then I will turn it over to Gary uh, to offer some comments and reactions. We will then have a few minutes at the end of the session for questions from the audience. So please hold off uh, asking any, any questions until the end, but if there are any clarifications needed, by all means, um, you can drop those in the chat as well. So let's begin with how we arrived here. Um, essentially, the Kleptocrats playbook is the result of the observation that there was no single resource devoted to analyzing the entire spectrum of maneuvers, strategies, tactics that kleptocrats employ, <clears throat> as um, Scott just, just mentioned uh, during his opening remarks. There are extensive case studies of um, certain tactics that kleptocrats use. There's also a lot of research on kleptocracy as a whole, but literature that ties together these disparate um, aspects or elements of transnational kleptocracy is hard to come by. So, this playbook is um, our response or an, an attempt to fill this gap. Uh, and we did that by systematically cataloging um, the suite of transnational domestic strategies that kleptocrats use. The playbook also introduces a comprehensive uh, definition of transnational kleptocracy that we think that captures the true nature of the phenomenon and that can serve as a working definition for those interested in delving uh, deeper into the topic. And the last main contribution um, from the, the document that we're presenting today is that in addition to describing the different tactics, we also include potential and proven responses to try to push back against kleptocracy. So taking as a whole, we think that this is a holistic source for understanding and combating um, kleptocracy. In terms of the methodology that we followed to completing this resource, we researched and wrote about uh, over 20 different kleptocratic tactics including some well-researched ones like bribery or embezzlement, but also, um, also uh, included more emergent but equally potent kleptocratic practices um, such as reputation laundering. 
the playbook is based on observations drawn from a variety of cases of transnational kleptocracy uh, around the world, as well as discussion with anti-corruption experts, law enforcement officials, and many others who really provided uh, critical insights. Um, um, chief among them was Nate Sibley from the Hudson Institute, who um, helped um, author um, several parts of the publication, and you will be hearing from him later uh, during the next panel. So just noted, um, we identified uh, a gap in the literature, um, which um, might be due to the fact that kleptocracy um, as an analytical framework only truly emerged um, in the last 20 to 30 years. And for a while, it really didn't catch the, the public's attention. Obviously, as of recently, there has been a lot of discussion on the topic. Um, you can see there a capture from a Google Trends search, which shows uh, searches for kleptocracy globally spiking uh, around uh, Putin's invasion of Ukraine. But despite this uh, appropriate, in our view, uh, characterization of uh, Putin's regime as a kleptocracy, we think that it's still an emerging concept and different people have different conceptions of it, um, which is one of the, the reasons that we embarked on this project. So how do we understand kleptocracy? Um, in the playbook, we try to make a concerted effort to distinguish kleptocracy from the centuries old grand corruption that we are all more or less familiar with. Um, kleptocracy is a phenomenon that um, really emerged at the apex of the current globalization period, which might be coming to an end. Um, and that's largely because globalization has generated new networks and opportunities um, for corrupt actors to um, extract uh, additional resource resources and then to launder uh, the proceedings for um, those uh, or of those illicit um, activities. So our definition for kleptocracy, as you can see on this slide, uh, recognizes this nexus between political corruption and authoritarian governance, uh, as well as its transnational dimension, which is really a defining feature, and the role that intermediaries and enablers uh, uh, play in making it possible. As noted, um, a key driver of cryptocracy is expansion of the, the opportunities uh, for it. So in addition to broadening the universe of tactics considered as part of the kleptocratic repertoire, the playbook also extends the traditional understanding of the economic basis of kleptocratic rule. So while kleptocrats uh, indeed still um, largely target public finances, uh, especially large procurements, hard currency reserves, um, as well as commodities and, and natural resources, they can also set their eyes and tentacles, and, and they do, on uh, other types of resources, including development and security assistance, and we saw this clearly in the case of um, Afghanistan, the private sector, uh, which was a big focus of uh, the first few years of the Chavez regime in Venezuela, where um, there were a lot of expropriations and nationalizations that were ultimately destined to benefit um, cronies of the regime. And then most recently through a strategic corruption, which uh, really targets the strategic assets of, of a country to provide that, uh, in, um, that which owns the resource with um, expanded opportunities for achieving foreign policy goals. With all this in mind, um, we developed a unique taxonomy of kleptocratic tactics that divides them based on whether they are deployed domestically or localized or transnationally, and across four categories um, as listed uh, on the slide, and we're gonna go into each category in a second. Some of these tactics uh, are obviously part of what we could consider the broader autocrats playbook, um, but here they're analyzed uh, and approached through the lens of um, the klepto kleptocratic conceptual framework, which really emphasizes the dual goal of self-enrichment and the furtherance of political objectives. So let's jump right in. The first category um, contains both political and legal tactics. Uh, I will not go over all of them, but I will know that the domestic tactics we cover here are the most uh, well-known perhaps or research tactics kleptocrats use to amass wealth and consolidate political power in their home countries. Um, they largely involve the ways kleptocrats use their position uh, of power to extract wealth from um, state institutions, um, all while also um, trying to garner support or at least complacency um, from other political and business elites. In contrast, 
the transnational tactics included here, strategic corruption and, and lawfare, are perhaps less well known. Um, strategic corruption represents an increasingly common tactic in, in, in the sense that um, bribery, extortion, and even statecraft um, are used to co-opt uh, officials and other elites in other countries. And this is for uh, foreign policy goals. And what we would refer here as lawfare has also become a key feature of cryptocracy and in includes the so-called slaps, the strategic lawsuits against public participation, among other legal mechanisms um, to intimidate journalists, essentially. Moving to economic and financial tactics, uh, under this um, category, I want to again highlight some of the tactics we cover that are less discussed in the cryptocracy literature. The purchase of positions, for instance, is a tactic that is largely seen in transitioning countries that are in the process of consolidating uh, state uh, structures. And it's quite literally um, a pyramid-like scheme uh, in which governments uh, or law enforcement positions are bought and sold, uh, and these positions are then used to extract additional illicit funds through extortion or bribery or through the selling of positions uh, beneath them. I also want to point out the concept of economic uh, capture uh, as part of the transnational uh, tactics, uh, because it really represents the nuances that we're talking about when discussing transnational cryptocracy. Traditional, traditionally, you would have scholars, um, practitioners, policymakers assume that with the integration of countries in the world trade system and with the uh, int intensification of financial ties, there would be also a transfer of democratic values. But we've seen that this process was definitely not a way with history when successful, but in fact has originated that uh, often you see the opposite happening. So as financial ties become uh, more intense, professional intermediaries such as lawyers, bankers, um, real estate agents actually become um, uh, a key piece of the structure for laundering, concealing, um, and dealing with illicit funds. So um, in other words, there's a transfer of corrupt values um, to traditionally democratic values uh, and therefore a subsequent degradation of democratic structures. It should come as no surprise that one of the categories included in the playbook is coercive and violence-based tactics. Um, these are really pervasive uh, aspects of kleptocracy um, since kleptocrats often rely on outright violence as well as other coercive measures to silent critics and shut down any possible threats to their standing. But kleptocrats also stick to power through other uh, less obvious means, um, for instance, through the enforcement of social norms uh, on corruption, which normally don't really require the use of direct violence. Um, instead, what kleptocrats do with the help of their chronics is to create a culture that normalizes corruption, uh, especially in kinship circles, in the workplace, and this uh, in turn prevents um, uh, ordinary citizens from speaking or acting against kleptocracy. Looking at the transnational side now, um, we see that kleptocrats are able to extend their reach before, uh, beyond their borders to repress international scrutiny um, or, to th uh, or, or threats to their practices. Uh, this can be through litigating against journalists or civic activists, as we just uh, noted, um, but also uh, through litigating against rival kleptocrats, and we saw this uh, during the 2000s in London among um, Russian oligarchs who were litigating against each other. Um, and another aspect of transnational um, coercive and violence-based tactics is the use of public relations uh, and lobbying firms to target political opponents that, have, uh, that might have spoken out against kleptocrats abroad. And lastly, also in some cases, um, very powerful kleptocratic regimes can weaponize international law to seek out extraditions uh, of this citizen to then put, punish them um, at home. Finally, uh, as the name of the category indicates, uh, under branding and uh, narrative-based tactics, uh, we include efforts by kleptocrats to improve their images and to increase their influence and power in the process. When we look solely at the domestic side, we see how kleptocrats use image management to cultivate a positive image within the country's population, uh, which obviously helps them consolidate power and hides um, or can hide the illicit nature of their activities. And they usually do this by 
uh, presenting themselves as the, the reformer um, by using the veneer of uh, democratic uh, institutions to legitimize their um, rule, um, et cetera. When we turn our attention to transnational, uh, the transnational version of this, where we see that reputational or reputational laundering is an increasingly defining feature of kleptocracy. Uh, this occurs through hefty donations to universities, think tanks, cultural, institu cultural institutions, frequently or typically in Western countries, um, which allow kleptocrats to boost their reputation uh, as generous philanthropists, uh, while also finding and, and funding an exit to, to at least part of their illicit funds. And oftentimes the influence that um, kleptocrats can gain in these settings uh, further helps them to influence the public conversation around their countries, which uh, ultimately helps to normalize their kleptocratic practices and also dissuades political academic elites in Western countries from being overly critical of, of certain uh, regimes and individuals. So now that we've discussed the different tactics that kleptocrats use, the question is what can democracies do to protect their own institutions uh, from these corrosive effects of transnational systematic corruption? And how can they also support those engaged in anti-kleptocracy efforts worldwide? Our playbook tried to do this uh, or to answer this question by um, including or featuring a detailed list of measures that are needed um, to keep kleptocrats at bay. And starting by those that can be implemented at the country level, we uh, begin with an um, overarching recommendation uh, to focus on systematic corruption risks. Uh, and by that, we mean to first recognize the scale of the problem and the responsibility of governments in enabling countries uh, to address the issue, and then uh, look at what are the areas vulnerable uh, to kleptocracy. In some countries, this might be the protections for investigative journalists. Uh, in other, they might have to do with banking regulations, but uh, it is often the case that is essentially all of the above. Second, and recognizing that kleptocracy is ultimately about stealing large amounts of money, um, a key response should involve prioritizing the fight against illicit finance uh, at home. Uh, and this can take the form of improving systems for uh, and rules for asset forfeiture, for anti-money laundering, uh, really looking at beneficial transparency issues uh, in a comprehensive way that is also involved in real estate and other uh, money laundering vehicles. And lastly, keeping an eye on uh, vulnerabilities to foreign authoritarian influence in the form of financial ties uh, and investments. Third, uh, empowering those uh, within and outside government who are directly fighting corruption is key. Uh, so this would uh, encompass supporting law enforcement agencies so they can uh, be effective in going uh, after corrupt actors and, and kleptocrats, uh, promoting um, broader transparency and accountability um, measures uh, domestically, and lastly, really ensuring that whistleblowers and those who in social, uh, in civil society, and in journalism are, are trying to unearth and, and uh, uncover cases, uh, have the legal protections and that, that they need. And finally, one perhaps obvious uh, measure that, that uh, can help uh, in uh, keeping these kleptocrats at base to curb uh, visa loopholes that are right now exploited in, um, that kleptocrats are right now exploding, although uh, we're happy to see some movement uh, due to, to Ukraine's invasion. Um, Shifting to the potential international responses to kleptocracy, the main recommendations that we make in the playbook are the following. Number one, to ensure the implementation of all international convenience and, uh, and rules uh, against corruption, including UNCAC, but also the OECD Convention on Combating Bribery of Foreign Public Officials, uh, and also to criminalize uh, foreign bribery. Currently, only a handful of governments or countries do this across the world, and it's urgently, uh, urgently needed that um, we add new, new countries to this list. The second response, uh, we would have probably written differently if we had, uh, if we were working on the playbook right now. Uh, it's really encouraging to see unprecedented uh, action to sanction uh, Russian oligarchs and, and kleptocrats. However, uh, many would argue that additional uh, work is needed to make sure that these sanctions are uh, really producing the desired effects and also uh, that they in the future are deployed probably earlier in the game to not uh, allow uh, for a situation like the 
one we're living uh, right now to, to be as likely. We're also seeing progress uh, with regards to the third response. The way, uh, in the, uh, the way the majority of democratic regimes have agreed to condemn the aggression of Putin's kleptocratic Russia on democratic Ukraine seems to be signaling that there might be momentum for democratic unity against kleptocracy. Um, you certainly see that at the transatlantic level, but again, it is an issue of sustaining this cooperation and, and, and listing uh, additional partners uh, in this um, struggle against kleptocracy. The fourth recommendation um, acknowledges that in essence, uh, as um, kleptocracy is a series of overlapping criminal networks, um, many of which are transnational and therefore uh, an effective response should be also networked, um, but we have an entire panel devoted to this, so I won't get, uh, I won't give away any more details. And lastly, and almost cross-cutting uh, across all previous responses, is addressing the role of transit and destination countries, which is ultimately why we're here today. Um, it looks like there is, uh, again, unprecedented momentum for this recognition due to the acknowledgement of the many grotesque ways uh, Russian oligarchs have abused Western jurisdictions. However, a lot more um, action and structural reform uh, are needed. Um, uh, and also here with an eye toward or on the emergence or consolidation of alternative transit and destination countries as Europe, the US and other countries crack down on kleptocracy. So we should be paying attention to what is happening with the Dubais, the Panamas and, and other jurisdictions uh, or other jurisdictions are around the world. We touch on some of the applications we see for our playbook, but just to summarize, and, and this is my concluding slide, we see three main ways this resource can contribute to the fight against cryptocracy. First uh, and foremost, we hope that the playbook helps uh, improve the understanding of a phenomenon that is complex and increasingly important. Second, uh, for those trying to identify entry points for doing anti-corruption and anti-cryptocracy work uh, and countering cryptocratic networks, uh, the playbook offers different options, um, which uh, we think can also make a positive contribution. And lastly, given the focus on responses to kleptocracy and the inclusion of case studies, we think that the playbook also equips potential activists, governments, and other partners with examples of the strategies and recommendations that can work. So with that, uh, and unless there is any need for clarifications, I uh, will turn over to Gary for his section of this presentation. Uh, thank you um, for that, and thanks IRF, IRI for holding this conference. Um, I really appreciate those comments, uh, and I think they are very informative. Let me start by um, saying that I, uh, when reading through the um, playbook, uh, I found that I think it's an important piece of work for several reasons, which I'm going to highlight uh, in the next few minutes. I'm going to just take uh, a few minutes to go through what I think are some of the most important takeaways from this, um, from the presentation and from uh, the research paper. I, I think, um, you know, one of the main takeaways, I guess I would start with, is the importance of understanding the breadth and size and scope and reach of the problem. Um, that that was really emphasized uh, both in terms of the rise of kleptocracy over the last uh, number of years, but also where we stand today and pulling uh, from some other research that was done, but also highlighting specific examples of the magnitude uh, of the problem. When I started working on uh, some specific legislation here in the United States about 10 or 12 years ago to pass a beneficial ownership registry, which we thought was a basic first step at the time, I remember hearing from policymakers and even allies uh, in the movement saying, yeah, we get it, but that's actually not that much money. Uh, it's not that big a problem. And so we have other things we're working on. And I think over the last 10 years, because of research uh, like this, people are beginning to understand the magnitude of the problem. And that in and of itself, I think is uh, critically important uh, for this audience and others to, to appreciate. So, so I wanna thank the researchers for, for that. Um, the second thing I would point out is uh, looking at the scope and types and ways in which different countries contribute to the problem. Um, I think it does an excellent job when it talks about uh, my organization, Transparency International, 
um, puts out the Corruption Perceptions Index, which uh, has a number of important uses in sort of looking at various perceptions of, corru of corruption in over 180 countries around the world. That's looking at domestic corruption. It's looking at um, you know, issues of what's going on inside the country in terms of open contracting and other types of um, activities uh, in terms of transparency and trying to crack down uh, on illicit uh, money uh, and corruption and conflicts of interest within those countries. It does. It is an important tool, but it is one tool, and I appreciate the fact that the uh, that this uh, index looks at, well, that this report looks at other indices, including the Financial Secrecy Index. But I'd also add that uh, Transparency International does a second report called Trouble at the Top. And that looks at uh, the quote unquote countries that are perceived to be clean, but in fact are aiding and abetting uh, the movement of illicit funds around the country, uh, around the world rather. And I think that that is important for us to understand if we're really going to make an impact uh, any serious impact. And we're seeing, uh, I think, uh, in today's crisis in Ukraine and the Russian oligarchs right now in moving money and having put money uh, around the world and the difficulties and challenges that that presents, um, both in terms of uh, undermining our own uh, economies, but also creating uh, national and international security threats. Um, I also think that uh, in defining the problem, there's a critical um, uh, piece in there that talks about how uh, kleptocracy in many, play, in many cases has teamed up with other illicit networks, criminal networks and others, that we are not necessarily just facing a series of individuals, but in fact criminal enterprises that have connected with kleptocrats uh, to move this money around the world. And I think if we're going to begin to address the problem, we need to understand the complexity of it. And so I appreciate that and think that that's an important aspect that was brought out in the paper. Um, when looking at sort of the international and transnational nature of the problem, um, many of the things that were just talked about, the, the solutions, I want to highlight a few of those because I think it's important for us. Um, we're beginning to see some movement uh, in uh, Europe and the United States and elsewhere uh, on several of these initiatives. Uh, we're also seeing, for example, um, uh, at the IMF uh, during the beginning of the COVID crisis, uh, when hundreds of billions of dollars were being moved uh, very quickly to respond to the crisis as was needed, but the lack early on of uh, individual, um, you know, anti-corruption measures in sp for specific countries meant that we saw uh, many billions of dollars lost to fraud, waste, and corruption. Uh, and that, uh, if we fully understand that and appreciate it, it does mean that uh, I think it did lead the IMF later on in its contracts. And if you look at sort of the evolution of the contracts, that later on they began to understand that they needed to include these as mandatory anti-corruption measures rather than suggestive uh, anti-corruption measures. And I think uh, we saw a greater um, use of those funds for their appropriate purposes. Um, so taking a little bit of time uh, will actually save us uh, a ton later on down the road uh, and is critically important if we want money to actually get to the people that need it, uh, the vulnerable populations uh, that were going to be served. Um, I think we're also seeing that uh, towards the end, um, it was mentioned about uh, cross-border communication or actually uh, the sanctions issue. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of sanctions go into place. And what we're seeing um, uh, happen more than it's happened in the past, uh, quite frankly, it's happened very rarely in the past, was the notion of coordinated sanctions. Um, and I think that that is something um, that people need to take a look at, along with greater cross-border communications. We don't live in an, a set of isolated countries anymore. There is a global economy, as we all know, and therefore cross-border communication, um, and you can get into the details about you know, mutual legal assistance treaty processes speeding up and being more efficient, or other ways of automatic sharing uh, of information, I think is going to be critical down the road if we're going to truly address this problem, and I appreciate the highlighting that in the paper. Um, the collection of beneficial ownership information, the role of enablers, um, I think has been highlighted and is 
Uh, one of, I think, the bright spots that we've seen in this movement where we're seeing increased uh, use of tools to crack down on the enablers who are helping to move the money and the secret vehicles that are used to move it around the world. There, I guess the one caution I would say that we're seeing is um, to some degree, as the systems are coming into place and the tools are coming into place, we're seeing uh, what works and what doesn't. And I would hope that governments, once they put something in place, don't walk away and said, oh, we did our job and that's it, but to actually look at how it's being implemented. And we're seeing some changes, for example, in the UK where they're going back and making some fixes, including things like verification and other details to really ensure that the tools that are being put in place are properly used and are going to be effective in helping law enforcement and others combat uh, kleptocracy and, and the role of illicit finance rolling through the, the global markets. A um, couple of other things. One, uh, I think the role of enforcement, uh, which was touched upon, uh, is critically important. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, Transparency International did put out a report uh, called Exporting Corruption, looking at, uh, I think it was around 40 countries um, where and how they were enforcing their foreign bribery laws. Uh, and of those, I believe, uh, based on cases uh, started and completed and, and actions taken, that uh, the assessment was about 40, I'm sorry, about four of the 40 countries were actively enforcing the laws, um, aggressively enforcing the laws. And that's a combination of things. Some of that is uh, in certain countries, political will. And so I think we need to address that directly. But it's also, I think in a number of countries uh, was a question of resources and a question of training. And I know that we've uh, talked to a number of law enforcement um, officials here in the United States and across uh, in other countries around across the globe. And these cases are very, very complex. Um, and uh, there are a number of, especially state and local uh, law enforcement agencies, um, uh, attorneys general and what have you that, um, that don't actually fully understand how to look for these cases, how to do the investigations and how to prosecute them in court. And so we're looking here and would love to partner across the countries to um, look at training academies or ways in which we can uh, increase law enforcement um, understanding of these cases, because I think that is, um, that is going to be critical moving forward. Uh, and then finally, I think uh, I would say uh, the report properly uh, talks about the role of um, civil society organizations, whistleblowers and journalists. And increasingly, we're seeing attacks as the report lays out in a number of places uh, where kleptocrats have uh, cracked down on the ability of those that are investigating and exposing corruption. And without those players, I think it's going to be very difficult um, to attack them. And so, you know, here in the U.S., there's been some additional funds um, trying to that were appropriated to try and address and help um, those uh, truth tellers around the world um, and give them some protections and would love to see some international cooperation uh, on, those, um, on those issues, uh, because I think that's gonna be the way in which we get the information we need. So those are just uh, some of my thoughts in reading through the playbook and hearing the presentation. Again, uh, a critically important piece. Um, and thank you for uh, including uh, me in this discussion. And I look forward to, to the following questions and discussion that we have following us. Thank you so much, Gary. Uh, we really appreciate your, your comments and reactions and they're duly noted. Um, as you pointed out, we have time now for questions from the audience, either here or virtually. Um, we have roughly, um, yeah, almost 15 minutes. So we definitely encourage those who are joining us uh, to post any questions, make any comments um, related to what they just um, heard. And I see that it might be one question in the chat, but it's a little bit too small for me to read the font. Oh, this is an easy answer. Um, so we're recording um, this um, conversation, so you can access the PowerPoint uh, via that. Otherwise, it is 
basically based on the information that is contained in the playbook, which is uh, accessible virtually. Uh, I don't know if the link is in the chat already, but otherwise we'll drop it so you can uh, read the, the playbook at your leisure. Thank you. Uh, hello, Ivan Beheim, IRI. Uh, you mentioned uh, in your presentation uh, uh, the importance of, of support uh, to whistleblowers. And I'm wondering, uh, during your research, have you come up, come across uh, maybe some, some legal holes or, or perhaps some interesting solutions uh, how to increase uh, support of, of witnesses of these crimes? Um, I, I can imagine in, in, in many times uh, uh, the, the, the crimes we are talking about are uh, sort of a white collar crimes in, in their nature. So perhaps it, it might be quite uh, hard to uh, to protect the victims and, and give them the kind of status of a vulnerable victim uh, uh, I mean, until the kind of the, the nature of the organized crime uh, uh, is, is, is proved. So do you perhaps have uh, anything interesting uh, to, to share on, on, uh, on this topic? Thank you. Thank you, Ivan. I would definitely um, uh, ask Gary to, to also answer this question because um, in terms of interesting um, or, or um, examples to share, um, nothing quite comes to mind. But the one thing I will say is that, as you noted, some of the challenges behind uh, effective whistleblowing uh, frameworks is that often, uh, even if there are, those are in place, uh, it is relatively easy given the nature of the crime to um, tr uh, to basically trace uh, um, the, the the whistleblower uh, that uh, originated the the or the, the blow the blew the whistle in the first place, and therefore that mm -hmm. can act as a as a um, dissuading factor for people to to come forward. But in, in other uh, perhaps less sophisticated um, jurisdictions, there's still a, a lot of room to uh, uh, or a lot of room for improvement uh, to make sure that uh, there is that the, that the category of of vulnerable um, um, the pop, uh, person can be granted, and that the other protections, especially that have to do with physical security, uh, that uh, can also be extended to the to the person uh, um, making that making that claim and, and bringing um, and bringing or uh, sharing a lead with law enforcement. But I wonder if, if Gary had um, something to add to that effect. Sure, I, whistleblower protections in jurisdictions vary very widely, um, and but I I would even say even in the jurisdictions uh, like the EU or the United States where whistleblowers have some you know pretty good protections, at least in our case, uh, and I would imagine others, there are loopholes and exemptions. Um, we protect whistleblowers not based on the information that they provide or the value of the information they provide, but rather by profession or where they work. Um, and to some degree, that's a little odd. So because there's concerns in our security sector, if you work in the security se sector right now in the United States, you have far fewer protections as a whistleblower than you do if you work in, say, the Commerce Department. Um, there's no real reason for that. And in fact, uh, as the paper notes, that the security sector is an area of growing concern. And so I think we need to make sure that in our own jurisdictions and sort of the jurisdictions that are supposed to be leading the way on whistleblowers, uh, that we're truly covering those that have the valuable information. And if people are willing to step forward and provide that um, uh, valuable information, we should be welcoming and we should make sure that, that we offer them protections. As for those in uh, more difficult jurisdictions, uh, you know, we've talked about, uh, and there are some rules that would allow for, um, you know, protections to invite people to give them visas or whatever to come to safer jurisdictions. Um, but th there are tougher, uh, as you noted, there are tougher situations, uh, and we still need to work those through. But I would start with the with the jurisdictions that are supposed to be leading the way um, to make sure that our laws are as robust and uh, as they need to be. I'll just stop there. Thank you, Beth. Are there any questions? I see there is a message in the chat, but I think it's just encouraging people to ask questions. While folks drop those questions there or raise their hands, I'll turn it over to Scott. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so Gary, I wanted to um, probe a little further 
uh, on something that you sort of you pointed to an egg air as well. Uh, so we're now seeing some actions underway in light of the the Russian invasion in Ukraine and and more, I guess, uh, sort of common a, a common set of purpose or agenda um, as it relates to the Russian oligarchs. Um, how how the, the what we're seeing today. <laughs> does bring some, I would say, new momentum or focus around the problem of kleptocracy and, and what to do about it. So in, in some of the things you've laid out, how, does, how should that perhaps inform our order of priority on, on what we, we prioritize for action now globally? Um, if I understand the question, what is it, where should we go with priorities? Because there's a lot of discussion, uh, and I assume this is also happening in the EU, but in the United States, every policymaker now wants to, quote, get in on it, right? They want to be able to put out the press release saying, this is my idea. The first thing I would say is people should come together and figure out exactly what your question is, is what are the priorities and let's move those. Because if you have a thousand ideas that are all competing for passage and discussion and debate, it's very hard to sort of then pick one or two that you move forward and we could come out of this with very little getting done. And that is, I think, uh, to be honest, it's, it's a concern of mine that everybody's so concerned about their own little idea that they're not looking at the bigger picture. Um, but if, if I were in charge uh, and uh, I think there's a few things that do rise to the top uh, and let me go through them. I think the first, uh, and foremost for me would be enforcement. Um, and I mentioned that before, but let me just sort of drill down a little bit on what I mean by that. We talked about the lack of enforcement of foreign bribery laws, but even internal that um, we realize budgets are tough, um, but um, cutting down on the enforcement um, is, is not as we see healthy for uh, global security. And so we need to sort of think through, um, you know, we're having debates now, we're about to enter a season in which we're debating budgets in the United States. And there's gonna be a lot of discussion about what goes to the Defense Department. Um, I would argue that given the national security priority that our financial intelligence unit and some of the um, uh, offices that are looking for kleptocratic money should be a national security priority. And in fact, last year, the President Biden did come out with a memo, a national security study memorandum, which is sort of an official statement out of the White House saying that corruption is now a core national security interest. So I think enforcement uh, is critical. We just came through a budget uh, process where some money, more money is going to enforcement. And I would hope that other jurisdictions would follow as well. So that's one thing. The other is, um, I think where we're seeing momentum is in the right place. Um, uh, implementing the beneficial ownership directories and getting those right, making sure the definitions are correct, the implementation, we're verifying the data, we're doing all the things that we've now learned are critical if these things are actually gonna be effective and we're not just uh, setting up information gathering systems for the sake of information gathering. And then lastly, uh, well, I guess two other things. One would be um, uh, the enablers. So looking at the lawyers, accountants, corporate formation agents, real estate agents, um, we are beginning to see the stories coming out in the press from investigative journalists and others where there's leaks and we're getting lucky to find this information um, on where this money is at. Um, you know, uh, we here in the United States are going through some, some rulemakings, but there was also a, a bunch of progress that has been made in the EU. And I would encourage people to continue that um, because that is, we need those people to be involved in this process. Otherwise we're never gonna find the information. And then finally, uh, when we do recover assets, uh, we need to, when we do find assets, uh, we're you know, freezing the assets, there's a process for eventually seizing the assets and figuring out how we do return them to the countries uh, that were impacted and affected. Obviously in the Ukraine and Russia situation, there's some complications there. Uh, and I think people are debating a lot of different ideas, um, but in general, uh, 
the people that from whom the money was stolen uh, and lack the ability to have services and are struggling, we need to find uh, more creative ways of putting that money back in those jurisdictions. So I, I would focus on those issues. Um, I think there's probably some others if I thought about it more, but uh, really those would be the ones to help us really identify where the assets are um, and have the resources to go after them. I would perhaps double down on, on your initial point, uh, Gary, about enforcement, not only in terms of providing um, law enforcement agency with the means that they need and not um, trying to find um, shortcuts uh, in terms of the resources that that need to be allocated, but also making good in the plethora of international commitments uh, and measures that are already there that if fully implemented could really uh, start at, um, closing the, the loopholes and create an environment that's much more conducive to um, non-kleptocratic um, rule. And related to that, I think that one thing uh, being IRI that I would like to see is a sustained recognition and elevation of this agenda as, as not only a core national security principle, as you were noting, Gary, but also as a, as a fundamental impediment to democratic development. And uh, we just came out of the Summit for Democracy in the US. And I think that uh, that, that was just a, yet another uh, forum to underscore the many ways in which corruption um, corrodes democracy. But I think that the emphasis on kleptocracy and the emphasis uh, on the enablers, as you were uh, uh, noting, Gary, as well, not only the, the cadre of professionals, but also countries that have uh, enabled kleptocracy is going to be critical to sustain uh, action. It, let me just, actually, one thing you said, just to double down on what you said, um, but to put a fine point on it is, you know, when you talk about the Summer for Democracy, we're going to host uh, a summer for the Americas. There's going to be additional meetings of the G20 and G7 coming up, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, countries have made a lot of commitments. And what you said is absolutely right, that if we could just follow through on the commitments that have already been made, countries have voluntarily made commitments to move forward on these issues. And if they literally just looked at those commitments, hundreds of commitments, um, maybe even thousands, if, depending upon how broad you want to look at uh, all the commitments made and from the various countries, if we actually could hold countries to those commitments, we would be in much better shape than we are now. Um, and I think the Western democracies need to lead the way. Any additional questions, either online or in the room? Still have a couple of minutes. I see a comment from my colleague Anna, linking the playbook. Um, all right, seeing that we don't have any uh, further comments, uh, I would like to thank Gary Kalman one more time uh, for being with us uh, today. We really appreciate it. And I will then introduce uh, our first, uh, the moderator for our first panel, um, who's uh, Bridget Millman. Uh, Bridget is a senior program officer with the National Endowment for Democracy, where she oversees a portfolio of global projects uh, that include corruption and kleptocracy. Bridget really has a, a wealth of experience on, on these issues, and we're very grateful that she will be offering uh, her expertise today. So I know that we're a couple of minutes early, but I saw Bridget uh, online earlier, so I'm trusting that she might be ready to kick us off. But maybe I spoke too soon. So, Bridget, are you there? You were there a few minutes ago. Yes, or... I'm here. Can you hear oh, me? Oh, you're here. So, I'm sorry. I know that we still have three minutes to go. But since we ended earlier, I was hoping that um, you could start. But um, we can we can wait for a little longer. Sure. Give me just a second so we can make sure that everyone on the panel has joined. All right. Thank you, Bridget. You can see them, but we have our two in-person panelists here, which is good. Okay, super. <laughs> Great. So it's my it's my pleasure to um, to moderate this panel, and I think that as we've all noted, it's an extremely timely topic. Um, the discussion of 
responding to transnational corruption and in particular how we can foster um, and facilitate more cross-regional collaboration on this, on this issue. Um, we have an incredibly experienced panel whose bios I'm just pulling up on the computer. Um, I will just note since I unfortunately cannot be with you all in Brussels, um, that if you have questions and you're virtually joining, please drop them in the, in the Zoom chat and we'll have a chance um, toward the end of the panel. Um, but then if you are in the room in Brussels and you do have a question, um, Agyar, I'll be relying on you and your colleagues to um, be relying on you and your colleagues to just like that for me, since I understand not everyone in the room necessarily has access to a device. Um, in any case, thank you all for joining um, during this very timely panel. Um, it's my honor to introduce our panelists. Um, first, my colleague, Melissa Aiton, a senior research officer with the National Endowment for Democracy, um, as, uh, with the International Forum for Democratic Studies, which is the Center for Research and Analysis at the NED. Melissa specializes in transnational kleptocracy and its impact on democracy and governance around the world. Um, as many of you know, she's also the co-author of the January 2018 Journal of Democracy article, The Rise of Kleptocracy, A Challenge for Democracy, um, and has also edited several kleptocracy-related publications. Um, we're also joined today by Nate Sibley, a research fellow at Hudson Institute's, at Hudson Institute's Kleptocracy Initiative. Um, Nate's research, which we heard a bit about during the previous presentation, explores the relationship between authoritarian regimes, transnational corruption, and US national security. Nate works very closely with the US administration and the Congress in order to advance innovative policies that safeguard the US financial system, target foreign corruption, and advance global leadership. Nate is also the co-author of three Hudson reports, including, including Countering Global Kleptocracy, and his work has been featured in um, a range of um, very prominent publications, including Foreign Policy on the Washington Post, among others. We're also joined um, physically in the room um, by Dr. Tanya Prelitz, um, a research fellow at the Demo Department of Politics and International Relations with the University of Oxford. Um, Dr. Prelitz is an academic focused on corruption studies and an expert in Southeast European politics. Um, she is currently a research associate um, for kleptocracy and anti-kleptocracy at the University of Oxford, a fellow at the Center of Advanced Studies at the University of Rijeka, as well as a research fellow at the University of Exeter, working on a project that seeks to explore the linkages between Russia's foreign policy and illicit financial flows. Last but not least, we're also joined by Stanislaw Ivashkovich, uh, the chairman of the Belarusian Investigative Center, the only specialized investigative outlet in Belarus. Stas was the recipient of the Belarusian Association of Journalists National Award for Investigations in 2018, 2019, and 2020, as well as the National Award for Analytics in 2021. Um, Stas has worked also as an investigative journalist with Radio Free Europe's Belarusian service, as well as Belsat TV. Um, so we have a, a very interesting range today of um, uh, uh, analytical and academic expertise, as well as on the ground um, experience with um, directly with these sorts of issues. Um, I'd like to turn it first to Melissa. Um, to kick us off. Um, Melissa, for the last few years, the Forum for Democratic Studies has produced original analysis and convened experts to unpack and explore the transnational nature of kleptocracy and the unique ways it challenges democracy globally. Um, could you please provide an overview of some of the key insights that have resulted from your efforts? Um, sure, thanks Bridget. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, okay, great. Um, so, um, thanks also to IRI for organizing this important conference, which I almost missed because of daylight savings time. Um, you know, it it seems a bit quaint now that the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, has has brought all this into to really sharp relief. But seven or eight years ago, when the National Endowment for Democracy started looking at kleptocracy as a long term threat to democracy. You know, the, the broader democracy community still largely thought about corruption as something that happens within national boundaries um, and whose impact was largely um, limited to those national borders. So obviously there were and are some really great anti-corruption groups um, who thought about corruption or kleptocracy in broader terms, but for the most part among the democracy community, which is obviously where, you know, Ned sort of fits in, um, you know, we we had been thinking about these um, issues in in this sort of um, national um, sense. So we um, 
we started trying to explain that, you know, what's going on now is not uh, your garden variety corruption. It's not your grandfather's corruption. It's sort of um, supercharged. And it's not enough just to look at the internal dynamics of a country. Um, kleptocracy is a transnational network system of theft and authoritarian influence that impedes and erodes democracy anywhere it touches. So, you know, as we've um, probably already heard, you know, the kleptocrats and their associates use a variety of tools to steal their country's wealth, push it through the international financial system, um, which, you know, obscures its illicit source. And then, you know, they tend to invest it in places where it is protected by strong rule of law norms, you know, typically the democracies, although places like Dubai are, are certainly also involved. Um, you know, in the countries that are captured by kleptocratic networks, the impact on democracy governance and socioeconomic indicators um, is just devastating. There's no other way to say it. Money that should go to schools, infrastructure, healthcare, and so on, um, instead lines uh, the pockets of a very small group of people. And then on the other hand, kleptocratic rulers have all the resources in the world um, to manipulate elections, create disinformation campaigns, and suppress civil society and independent media to ensure that they stay in power you know, for essentially as long as they like in most cases. Um, when there is a democratic opening or transition in these settings, um, those transitions often just don't stick because you know, the new leadership of the country might have the best of democratic intentions, but those kleptocratic networks are still powerful and they're still operating behind the scenes, sort of ready to exert, re-exert control if their resources or access to them are threatened. I don't think the democracy um, community has quite figured out who, how to address this issue, but you know, we just see it again and again, most recently in Sudan and Burma, where there's a big moment of hope and then, you know, everything kind of goes back to normal. So it's, it's a really pressing, pressing issue that we need to figure out. Um, in the democracies, the impact is often, you know, more of a subtle erosion um, of democratic norms and values. So the so-called enablers, the people who help kleptocrats steal the country's resources and help launder them, also help kleptocrats rebrand themselves from repressive thieves to what Tena has called engaged global citizens. I'm sure Tana will get into this um, more in, in, during her remarks, um, so I won't go into it here, but it's important to know that these enablers, the, so, you know, the bankers, the lawyers, the PR firms, so on, we all know who they are, um, are often among the most powerful and influential groups in the democracies, which makes them um, difficult to um, act against. The impact can also be much more direct in terms of influence peddling, influence over democratic institutions, and then you know, just outright lobbying. And because most of the democracies you know, lack effective methods of identifying beneficial ownership structures, while it's changing, it's still not there yet, um, it can be really difficult to track and understand who is doing the influencing and whose interests are being representative. And we've seen this um, you know, very clearly with the Russian oligarchs in the UK. So I'll stop there for now and you know, look forward to hearing from the other panelists into the, the Q&A session. Thanks very much, Melissa, for that very robust overview of the problem that we're tackling. Um, I'm going to mix up the order a bit and Antenna and Stas turn first to you as I think that um, Nate has been having the same issue as the other panelists who are joining from the US who weren't aware that European clocks changed on Sunday. Um, so while we wait for Nate, if you wouldn't mind, um, Tena, your research has explored the way that the UK enables the kleptocrats of Eurasia and weakens their rule of the rule of law. Um, could you please provide an overview of the different ways um, that this occurs? as well as um, how your assessment um, of recent announcements and measures by the British government, for example, the proposal to rein in SLAP lawsuits. Thank you, Bridget, and thank you very much to the IRI to, for the invitation. It's a uh, really a pleasure to be part of this uh, distinguished panel and to discuss this super important issue, uh, which we're all glad that it is finally receiving the right attention, but unfortunately for the very wrong uh, 
most uh, most wrongest possible reasons. So uh, yes, thank you so much for introducing our our research. So uh, as a team of authors, uh, alongside uh, researchers from uh, other universities in the UK and in the US, um, as well as uh, working alongside investigative journalists and uh, civil society campaigners, um, we have published this uh, um, uh, output that is our main policy report called the UK kleptocracy problem. Uh, that was published uh, um, by Chatham House in December last year. Um, and um, I mean, what, what really is glaring though is, uh, as was explained very, um, very interestingly and very in depth by Aguiar uh, earlier on, is that of course the UK's kleptocracy problem is really uh, problems in the plural, not only one. Because um, really what it is about is uh, uh, the creation of an ecosystem of uh, mutually reinforcing layers. Uh, that work in conjunction uh, to enable these dynamics that we're discussing. Um, the UK has been part and parcel and uh, I would say at the forefront of, of these dynamics for a while. And we have a situation um, in a nutshell in which uh, you have lawyers who protect uh, the money which is hidden from the scrutiny of uh, underfunded uh, police officers and uh, uh, law enforcement agents in general. Um, in this way, they hide them through banks, who of course played a role as well. Um, and uh, this wealth, this money is protected through shell companies uh, and offshore territories. Um, and it can then be used to buy luxury goods and of course property. And all the while, sometimes these very same lawyers um, manage the immigration procedures of, uh, of many of these uh, um, kleptocrats uh, laundering their money. Where, uh, while PR managers also help with their reputation enabling uh, and also institutions, very reputable institutions, accept donations that make them uh, make it possible for such individuals to present themselves as uh, philanthropists, as do-gooders. And of course, you have the role of the politicians who also uh, for a very long time have been turning a blind eye or two and sometimes even participating in such dynamics by accepting donations or even giving peerages. So this is a very quick overview to see how multifaceted the, the problem is and how these enabling roles are really played um, from a, a varied ecosystem, uh, which we unpick uh, in, this, uh, in this report. And alongside this report, we also published an annex uh, that details about two billion uh, pounds of uh, property uh, detailing uh, up to 100 cases of UK residential property that was bought by um, Eurasian kleptocrats. So this is really just the tip of the iceberg because we're focused mostly on Central Asian um, uh, um, politically exposed persons, uh, PEPs. And I'm happy to say that this evidence was used uh, in Parliament by some uh, MPs, UK MPs, who have uh, quoted it as a basis to sanction um, kleptocrats from Kazakhstan after the event uh, that have occurred in Kazakhstan in uh, January this year. Uh, and yet, although there is broad uh, agreement uh, to, to sanction these individuals, no one has been sanctioned yet. So I think this is an indication of, um, uh, well, the slow pace with which we're moving in spite of uh, the very, very real need. Um, so I'd like to focus on just a couple of um, important takeaways from, from our research. Um, and one is why the uh, anti-money laundering system in the UK has not worked uh, so far. Um, so we argue that uh, uh, the AML regime in the UK um, has actually not only not worked, but uh, in an inadvertent way, perhaps, it has served even to reflect and reinforce power relations in kleptocracies. So now it is unfortunately all too clear why to um, dealing with this issue is both an internal problem in, uh, in the West, meaning that it weakens our own rule of law, but also very um, distinctive and very urgent foreign policy problem because we need to disrupt the accumulation of resources that allows kleptocratic elites to accumulate and consolidate power. And we've seen how quickly an authoritarian regime can turn into a totalitarian one. So indeed, I think the need for this is very, very clear. And yet, um, as I mentioned, we find that actually the opposite has happened in a key piece of UK legislation that was uh, hailed initially as a as a, um, really world leading in terms of uh, combating uh, money laundering, which is the unexplained wealth orders, UWOs. 
Um, so unexplained wealth orders were introduced um, because um, there were um, because the, the, the legislation that was already present with the civil recovery uh, orders uh, was ineffective in cases when there was little or no evidence about the source of funds. So um, the aim was to sort of flip uh, the burden of proof and to place it on the respondent in cases where known sources of wealth uh, were believed to be insufficient to purchase the asset in question. And yet this was both, uh, um, the, their effect is both underwhelming and, uh, as I mentioned, uh, serves as, uh, as a reinforcement to power structure. So underwhelming because uh, uh, although in 2017, when they were introduced, um, uh, there were hoped about 20 cases per year, in truth, until now, we have only four uh, UWOs that have issued so far, none since 2019, so since the last uh, uh, government by Boris Johnson has been in place, and also none against Russian uh, citizens. Um, why reinforcing power structures? The main issue, the, the core of the matter, is the fact that uh, um, it is very difficult to link a predicate crime to uh, a system uh, in a kleptocracy where such crime is not necessarily, does not necessarily correspond to grand corruption. So the issue is that we have been continuing to accept evidence from the kleptocracies themselves uh, on what constitutes corruption or not. So the a uh, net effect has been that only the very, in the very limited cases when there have been sanctions, and this is only one UWO out of the four, it was only the exiles, so those uh, individuals who have already fallen in disgrace with the kleptocratic regime, uh, in this case and with uh, Azerbaijan, the Kajieva case, uh, is where they were sanctioned in the UK, whereas never the incumbents. And this is also reflected by our um, property um, uh, database um, in which the 73 properties that were owned by incumbents, none of them was lost yet. Whereas of the 15 exiles, uh, those who uh, are, were in disgrace with the regime, 13 of them were, were lost. And final point, uh, the focus of, on enablers, as has already been mentioned, has really been uh, very lacking uh, in the UK. And generally, uh, the, the core issue is that we've been responding, um, um, the, the, uh, the UK's legislation in that sense has been very responsive and very ad hoc, rather than tackling uh, something that is, it, is indeed systemic. And for this reason, uh, we do argue that the whole paradigm shift uh, is needed. And since the topic of this uh, of this panel is on creating networks to combat a network, I would really highlight what was already mentioned um, on the need to put to place this uh, topic very high on the international agenda to uh, be very clear about its uh, fundamental importance for the uh, world situation in this moment and to act as a network in coordination between the UK, the EU, the US and other key jurisdictions that really have uh, are also part of the problem uh, and really uh, stepping up to uh, could be uh, the part of the of the solution to, to this issue now. I will stop here and I look forward to the discussion later on. Thank you so much, Tana. And of course, as we begin to discuss um, a networked approach to fight kleptocracy, um, one key element of a, an effective network approach is investigative journalism, um, which we know can be a very powerful tool against kleptocracy and an excellent idea, uh, an excellent example of how transnational collaboration can be effective both in exposing as well as raising awareness of this grand transnational corruption. Um, however, as we've seen, journalists still face tremendous challenges due to repressive backlash and limited resources in the jurisdictions where they are most needed. Um, so Stas, I would turn to you. Um, can you please describe to us how the international community could better support the sorts of investigative journalism efforts that you are leading? Interesting to hear about the <clears throat> international um, efforts to battle the corruption, that, uh, the corrupt schemes that we're finding in Belarus, and uh, we are finding them not tackled in uh, very often <clears throat> abroad. And uh, yes, yeah, so it's uh, interesting to hear the challenges that the policymakers uh, abroad are facing. For example, uh, before I move on to your questions, uh, a bit of a reaction to the things we've heard about sanctions. So, for example. Uh, Belarus uh, authorities and businessmen close to them have been sanctioned 
uh, already for quite a while, for one and a half years that harsh sanctions have been put against them. And what we have seen is that uh, very often they are, uh, the sanctions against individuals, economic sanctions against individuals are very easily dodged uh, by simply re-registering properties on uh, uh, employees, but also even family members. So, for example, in uh, in the U.S., uh, U.S. is more efficient at sanctioning. So, when the U.S. sanctions, then the um, a property, and if you change the ownership of the property, then you uh, carry the burden of proof to that this. Uh, uh, change of uh, ownership was not just to avoid the uh, the sanctions, but uh, I mean, if you are an oligarch close to the government in Russia or in Belarus and you expect to be sanctioned, um, uh, if you if you approximately know the sanctions date uh, and you change the ownership of your assets and of your companies to uh, to employees or family members, right now there is a very weak mechanism of actually sanctioning these assets and these companies. And we've seen, for example, those uh, close to Alexander Lukashenko, including some Russian oligarchs uh, participating in Belarus Russia corrupt schemes, all their businesses off the hook because uh, it has been re-registered. And <clears throat> uh, when uh, we're talking to, expert, uh, to experts, and obviously they're uh, ambassadors, representatives of uh, enforcement bodies, uh, currently there is this uh, system that uh, even, for example, uh, your businessman who is sanctioned and you transfer ownership to your son, um, then uh, in order to sanction the son, the authorities still have to prove that there were direct financial flows from uh, the son, from his companies, to that physical person, even though uh, obviously we know that these financial flows usually go to offshore companies and, uh, um, and even if that son works inside the company, so uh, obviously... Uh, for obviously, the sanctioned person is still in control, but his business is very often off the hook. So this is a big problem uh, right now in uh, both in the U.S. and, e and the e EU. So one of the uh, one of the ways to tackle it would be uh, probably to uh, to put the burden of proof. Uh, sort of, uh, no, nobody likes this word, the presumability of guilt on all deals around sanctions, uh, sort of a few months before and a few months after, uh, that uh, the, the, the party that uh, gets the ownership of, uh, of an asset that was recently sanctioned or is about to be sanctioned has to prove that it was not to avoid the sanctions. Um, and uh, yeah, going back to your, uh, going back to your question, um, what uh, obstacles we've been facing? Well, obviously, in uh, Belarus, uh, we uh, Belarus is uh, very often a bit of a testing ground for uh, for Russian authorities when they want to intensify the repressions. So. Um, um, our team has been forced to relocate in uh, this summer of 2021. We try to stay as long as is possible. And uh, so at one point uh, when, the, when there was a crackdown of us, so, uh, on us, so uh, a head of our anti-fake show spent a week in jail. So she was le uh, released without a passport that she would have to show up uh, in a few days uh, to further questioning. So she uh, escaped without the passport across the green uh, border. Uh, unsuccessfully, so she, she was caught, she was put in jail again, but uh, a lawyer managed to pull her out the next day before they knew who they had, so she took another run for the green border and actually made it uh, to safety. So uh, with, the, uh, the, with the different variations uh, of uh, adventurousness, uh, the, um, our team of about 25 people has uh, been uh, able to make it out, unlike our colleagues, investigative, uh, two investigative journalists, one is Denis Savashin um, of Nova Chas newspaper. He is in prison now for over a year without court. And uh, he made an investigation that uh, um, a policeman that used to work for Berkut in Ukraine, uh, Berkut is the special force uh, police uh, famous for uh, brutalities in 2014, that some of them worked in 2015, uh, that, that some of them uh, worked in uh, Belarusian uh, uh, police force as well. So uh, uh, yeah, now he uh, now he's faced with treason uh, and is facing up to 15 years in uh, uh, in jail. And before that, the immediate reason to detain him was that he was obstructing the work of police officers by um, making public information that they desired to keep secret. So this is uh, more or less the exact formulation. And this formulation has been used on him first, and it can be used pretty much to 
um, against anybody. You can charge uh, any investigative journalist. You can charge him for treason uh, because he was making uh, public information that the official uh, desired to keep, to keep secret. This way, he was obstructing the official's work, therefore obstructing the national security, um, uh, and uh, and so on. So this is what is being used. And uh, another journalist uh, was. Uh, arrested as a result of a police setup. So they had uh, police cameras um, planted in an office and a, a businessman invited him in uh, and offered an, a donation and at the same time offered a, uh, a tip off for a corrupt scheme. So uh, as a result of that conversation, a um, few days uh, later, he was detained shortly. And then uh, he stayed in Belarus and, uh, and uh, continue, well, he stopped pub uh, publishing investigations directly, but he cooperated with us, for example, the Belarusian investigative center. So four months ago, he was uh, uh, arrested and now he is in prison. His, uh, his primary investigations was uh, of uh, uh, corrupt schemes in the health sector where uh, the brother of current uh, prosec prosecutor general is a big player. So, um, yeah, these are obvious. Uh, so some of the obstacles we're facing are the repressions. And uh, another one is uh, access to information. Of course, it was uh, never great, uh, especially in Belarus. And uh, in Russia, it's getting worse as well. So uh, we don't get any uh, replies uh, to uh, official requests, like freedom of uh, information requests that exist in Belarus. But uh, you just get a, a, a reply which which says uh, which says nothing and uh, more and more inf information is being closed uh, even officially so uh, on the auspices of uh, national security so first they closed the data on tobacco experts because national security in belarus is number one contraband of tobacco uh, uh, in the in the eu and and the uk so uh, yeah they closed the data on that now they close the data on the sanctioned products like potash and uh, petroleum products um, and so on and uh, yeah, and they uh, keep uh, posting less and less data on public procurement uh, websites, on the company's financials and so on. So uh, it is getting obviously increasingly uh, difficult to investigate that. Uh, however, we, uh, in these circumstances, we have actually expanded both the level and the number of our investigations, which was uh, uh, like a combination of uh, three factors. For one thing is the international cooperation. Well, well we've always had it. We're a member of uh, Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, uh, OCCRP, and also uh, uh, worked with um, ICIJ on uh, on the leaks on Pandora Papers, but only when we were forced abroad is when we really forced, uh, like, uh, made uh, use of the international partnerships, which uh, uh, allowed us to trace basic, well, it, it's actually, if you look at it, very similar schemes, most of them uh, going through uh, different Seychelles companies, uh, vehicles to beneficiaries in uh, Cyprus and Arab Emirates. So these are the two locations that both oligarchs in Belarus and Russia uh, like to like to hide in. So just uh, some of the, um, okay, well, I can give some of the examples. Uh, later, so for uh, one thing is the um, international cooperation. Uh, the second thing was obviously the uh, government of uh, Lukashenko uh, seems to actually have lost a lot of public support, even among the uh, among the authorities, among the public officials. So huge amount of leaks uh, allowed us to uh, to uh, to get uh, documents and to clarify investigations that have been going on for a while. Uh, both in Belarus uh, and uh, have also some, and also on some uh, Russian and uh, aspects that our neighbors have been investigating as well. And uh, the third uh, thing uh, was uh, uh, was actually the economies of scale that we were able to reach uh, through the fact that since 2018 it was when our center was formed, and before that uh, uh, you had like uh, I don't know uh, one investigation about two years in all Belarusian media combined and uh, when OCCRP uh, launched our project it was it took about three to four years to actually uh, build uh, a, a number of investigations with uh, like half a year pipeline each for them uh, and uh, to build to build the the numbers in the team that uh, would be able to uh, to apply the muscle the investigative muscle on the on the research necessary to uh, to overcome the obstacles so basically I mean uh, always uh, 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 investigative journalists and uh, the 
uh, corrupt officials, it's always like an arrow and a shield. So uh, you have a shield, uh, then the arrow becomes a bullet. They think of some tank armor. Then you have to think of a rocket. And uh, obviously, it's uh, a very long process of actual continuous, uh, continuous uh, improving of or qualification and growing career investigators. Uh, to actually be able to uh, to keep up with that uh, uh, arms race, if uh, we continue that uh, comparison, because uh, uh, there is a lot of great investigative journalists in Belarus, and uh, uh, those that I mentioned are among uh, uh, among them. But uh, uh, it is actually only uh, specialized out outlets and coalitions of specialized outlets with career investigators that have been trained for years and have been uh, uh, improving their qualification for years and, and increasing their um, their uh, source base uh, for years that have been actually to uh, being able to crack schemes such as proving bribes directly to the uh, to the surroundings of Alexander Lukashenko, the ownership of uh, by his family of uh, uh, of assets abroad and taking advantage of uh, corrupt deals with uh, uh, with uh, uh, with other countries with other countries. So yeah, these are some of the obstacles we're facing, and uh, yeah, the way international community could help uh, is uh, two things uh, for one, uh, several things. Uh, one thing is uh, 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 to increase the uh, access to public records of uh, all the countries, including EU countries. This is where the uh, corrupt officials like to hide their uh, assets because for one thing, they like to hide their assets in all these uh, extravagant locations like Seychelles Islands or British Virgin Islands, something like this, but where they like to land their capital, their properties are safe countries like Switzerland, like the UK. Um, so the uh, access to public, and yet, uh, yeah, in the, for example, in the EU without the partners, we, we were helpless for a long time. Uh, each country is uh, has such uh, uh, specific uh, to it ways of looking for these uh, public records, like Greek uh, Cyprus database, for example, the one that we use most of, often, they like to uh, just post scans of uh, uh, documents in Greek, which you, okay, I mean, obviously it's uh, solved through some uh, IT, IT tools, but uh, yeah, so that, uh, that would help. Um, and um, yeah, obviously the uh, consistent and uh, um, and long-term support to investigative journalists, uh, targeting it as uh, as something that evolves and develops, as opposed to that it, uh, of something that can appear overnight once you start finding it and will appear again once you stop and restart finding it, like in the five years or so. Or so. Thank you very much, Stas. And I think that's especially helpful in terms of keeping in perspective the timeline um, that it takes to cultivate, even with experienced partners, in terms of these these sorts of uh, transatlantic transnational journalistic collaborations, right? That it takes time, it takes expertise, and it takes patience and committed support. Um, that is something that, as we've seen this unprecedented rallying of the transatlantic community in response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine um, and the ongoing um, uh, conflict there, um, that does beg the question, looking to the, the current context of, um, of sanctions that have been imposed, of the responsiveness of the, um, as, as Tenna put it, um, finally the, um, the right attention, but for the wrong reasons. Um, and so perhaps we could turn um, looking more toward this response that we've seen um, to the current, current events in the context of uh, the tran transnational corruption. Um, and I'll turn back to, um, Back to Melissa, I think we've heard um, through all three of the panelists thus far um, about the myriad ways in which kleptocrats launder their reputations, seek safe landing spots for their assets, um, and really the, the network of enablers um, that facilitates um, the, the money to land um, in whether real estate, luxury goods, other safer markets um, overseas. Um, Melissa, you've written that kleptocracy is a multifaceted threat to democracy that res requires a coordinated and sophisticated transnational response. So looking at precisely this transatlantic cooperation that we've seen arise in the past few weeks, um, could you explore why are transnational responses necessary to successfully counter kleptocracy? Um, but perhaps most importantly, 
what, um, in your view, based on your research, are some of the key elements of a successful anti-corruption network? Yeah, so, I mean, your the answer to your first question is really easy. Um, you know, a, a transnational networked response is required because kleptocracy is a transnational um, networked phenomenon. So, you know, that old saying that um, it takes a network to beat, beat a network is, is just true. Um, the guys on the ground can't do it um, by themselves. So they, they need to be connected to groups and places where the money is spent to be effective. Um, you know, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has sort of um, stimulated a really loose but sort of cool network of activists um, working together to do things like, you know, the, the basics of like tracing financial flows, um, monitoring the, the movement of oligarchs, planes and yachts, and then, you know, tracking the actual implementation of the, the many, many sanctions that have been um, proposed around the world against Russian in interest. Um, so this sort of organic, um, like rapid response type network is, is great. Um, groups are able to kind of just see a need or a niche that they can fill and, and they just you know do it. Um, but for this to be a, a long lasting um, response, the, there needs to be a more formal network. Um, and it, it might consist of some of the, the following components. And a, a lot of this is already sort of there, but we just need to figure out a way to, to formalize the, the network a bit more. So, you know, things like obviously civil society groups um, in both, you know, source and destination countries that are, you know, trained and able and have the capacity and the funding to trace illicit financial flows, build PEP databases, and then just develop really creative ways to make sure that all the information that they're um, gathering, you know, hits the right audiences, um, makes its way to um, policymakers and um, people who are, you know, able to um, enforce violations and whatnot. Um, then, you know, we've already seen a tremendous amount of success with uh, network journalism, as we just heard. Um, groups like IC ICIJ and OCCRP and, and Finance Uncovered have just done amazing work in and sort of changing the model of um, journalism from one that's you know based on competition to one that's based on collaboration. And then those three groups also have a built-in training component, which is um, great because it has an obvious amplifying effect. But we need more of them. Um, you know, we need many, many more groups like this um, who have the funding and the capacity to be able to take on these massive um, collaborative exercises. Um, it's really important that part of the network also includes groups that are able to evacuate activists um, and protect whistleblowers because this is really dangerous work and the activists and journalists working on these issues, you know, obviously often find themselves at risk and they need a place to, to go when things get too hot. Um, policymakers from, you know, across the democratic world, not just the US and UK, um, who are willing to have, you know, sort of regular um, consultative meetings with activists working on these issues at the local level um, are needed to, to, to allow a, a really frank conversation about possible unintended consequences of, of different policy measures. And then, you know, to identify the, the many, many, many ways that kleptocrats will um, have and use to skirt those measures once implemented. And you know the local activists and journalists are the ones who know best. They know the players, they know the um, methods. So it's really important to kind of have them linked in with the, the policymakers who are proposing these um, policies. Um, lawyers are really needed um, who are able to provide pro, pro bono legal services to support journalists threatened with um, slap lawsuits. You know, it doesn't even um, take a lawsuit going to court to sort of ruin a civil society organization, just the threat um, can, can really cause some damage because of the cost involved with um, defending themselves. Um, and then, you know, from a, from a funding perspective, um, you know, it's really important that funders um, who wanna work, who wanna, you know, provide grants to, to people working on these issues, um, 
you know, they need to understand that these need to be large grants. This work is not cheap. It's long term. Um, it requires, you know, a big legal defense component, personal security components um, as, as part of their grants. And then, you know, a lot of the, the groups who are able to do this work, you know, are outside of the, the countries that they're working on because it's just too dangerous for them to, to be inside. So, you know, I think a lot of funders sort of prioritize um, groups that are on the ground, which makes sense in a lot of um, contexts. But for the ones fighting kleptocracy, I think, um, you know, equal, um, equal attention should be paid to the, the groups, uh, you know, working sort of in the expat community. Um, you know, it is not easy to build these kind of networks. It just takes a lot of time and sort of repeated interactions among people so that they have um, the opportunity to build trust. And, you know, convenings like this, in addition to being, you know, like a good academic exercise, which I'm always in favor of, um, but they're really important in building that trust. And, you know, especially once we're all comfortable kind of going back in person to convene. Um, so, you know, hopefully uh, part of this strategy will be, you know, increased funding for, for this kind of convening. So people have that opportunity to have the face-to-face -face interaction that's needed. Great, thank you so much, Melissa. Yes, again, quite quite a lot there in terms of how can transnational networks be more effective and perhaps just to the point on needing to ensure that there are protection mechanisms in place for those courageous whistleblowers, journalists, other activists who are sounding the alarm um, and raising the visibility of these concerns. Um, we've certainly seen in a number of the regional and cross-regional programming and efforts to um, sort of intentionally support whistleblowers per se, um, that mechanisms such as the EU temporary relocation platform um, and protect defenders out of Brussels um, can be wonderful resources for those civic activists um, and are very good examples of helping to rally the global protection community um, in order to support not only frontline grassroots activists, but also some of the individuals who may be encountering threats and repression as a result of this work. Um, in addition, looking to some of the work on SLAPs, um, as well as some of the discussion that's been taking place in, in Brussels, specifically with, with regard to um, setting um, SLAPs, um, lo looking to the, the challenges in, in, in pioneering um, democratic norms and values, um, and looking to that as, a, as an example as well for other democracies and other regional mechanisms that are looking to adopt or emulate some of the standards that are that are set. Um, so it is it is important to bear in mind that to the extent that some of these communities are already active um, or that Brussels has also been used as a platform for some of these other efforts, um, that it can also be a matter of connecting and plugging in some of these kleptocracy actors, anti-kleptocracy actors um, to those, um, those efforts that have been uh, well resourced and met with a measure of success thus far. Um, so just, just to editorialize uh, in a footnote there. Um, <coughs> Tana, but getting into um, some of the other areas in which um, we've seen um, kleptocrats invest efforts, and you've touched on this in your opening remarks, um, the question of reputation laundering um, and the investment in the networks of, um, the networks of enablers, of PR firms, um, of law firms, and so on. Um, so could you explain why you view this as a particularly corrosive aspect of kleptocracy? Um, as well as how you would see that networked approaches might be deployed in order to reduce the space for kleptocratic and oligarchic reputation laundering. Sure, so reputation laundering indeed is part of this puzzle that we are um, we're looking at. And um, uh, as, as Melissa mentioned earlier, um, it really does turn kleptocrats into engaged global citizens um, because ultimately the success of, of um, kleptocracy resides in the fact of being hidden in plain sight. So it's not enough to um, launder your, your money. You also need to establish your reputation as a, a citizen, an engaged citizen that can really uh, melt in the, in the elite. Uh, and that is why all those uh, mechanisms that uh, are aimed at burnishing one's reputation are uh, important and are indeed part and parcel of, uh, of what other problem that we're discussing. Um, libel law was already mentioned earlier on, uh, and a special problem for, for the UK, uh, and libel tourism, especially as, uh, as an, an avenue for 
for people to bring their issues, their grievances against uh, critics in other countries and bring them into the UK where libel law is, uh, has been famously very, um, very lax um, and sort of get, uh, get a win there. Uh, luckily, this, this has changed a little bit lately, but uh, it has been a distinct problem for, for years. Slap suits, as you mentioned, and uh, this wider issue of the cease and desist letters as well. So it's not only outright uh, lawsuits, but very often journalists. Uh, and let me say that it's really humbling to hear all your efforts um, uh, from uh, of your of your center from Belarus. Really, it, it takes you know the fight to go to a different level. But you know, in our very small um, um, remit as, as researchers, we also paradoxically received some cease and desist letters after publishing a report on that was exactly describing these, these issues. So ironically, you know, um, uh, lawyers and, and other enablers are, are still involved in that as well. And then there's this issue of philanthropy um, in which um, we focused our attention specifically on donations to universities. And once again, thank you, Melissa, for your support <laughs> for this research agenda. And we've looked at uh, how uh, donations to large and very well-established universities in the UK and in the US um, can um, become an avenue for, for reputation laundering indeed. Um, so in the UK specifically, there has been sort of a sea change in the way that universities perceive this, this issue as being a problem. And this has occurred after uh, the Gaddafi scandal at the LSE in 2010, which was followed by um, an inquiry called the Wolf Inquiry and the Wolf Report. Uh, which we found in our um, in our interviews and through our survey of Russell Group Universities, that is held as the Bible of um, uh, for for those working in university administration and 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 trying to um, uh, well vet the donations. And yet we also found out that since this is not uh, uh, in any way a legal requirement, uh, the very basic uh, tenets of this Wolf Report, um, them being that uh, the um, uh, the guidelines for accepting donations nations are publicly available and uh, that uh, the um, there is an independent gift committee um, making a decision on uh, on uh, um, donations that uh, that may be uh, great that may be problematic so this is implemented only in uh, six or seven out of uh, uh, the 26 if I'm not mistaken Russell group universities that we've uh, um, we've analyzed and still you know very um, uh, insistent problems of reputation laundering remain uh, why is this happening? I mean, the main issue, the first point to start from is really the tra transparency of donations, which at the moment is absolutely uh, not uh, a requirement in the UK. It is a requirement in the US, but uh, it has not been enforced uh, in, a, in a proper way until at least until recently. So there are problems there as well. Uh, but I mean, this really is a very, very clear uh, possibility for, for change. And um, we've been um, uh, together with the uh, Academic Freedom and internationalization working group in the UK, we've been pushing not only for a code of conduct to be implemented by universities themselves, so for this bottom-up approach um, done by universities, but also indeed for a change in the law in the higher education bill that would uh, uh, make it uh, a requirement for universities to publish their donations. And we're seeing that there has been some, some take up. There are discussions about that. Uh, but I would like also to mention a um, sort of, um, well, a loophole or a problem in the take up. So the take up has been specifically because there is this focus and rightly so at the moment at countering autocratic regimes such as uh, Russia and China. So there has been um, uh, several MPs from both sides of the aisle have said, okay, let's, uh, let's you know, push for the introduction of an amendment that would make it a requirement for foreign donations to be reported. And yet, this is not enough, in my view. Um, for once, it's not enough because, I mean, reputation laundering also happens from our own, um, uh, you know, uh, wealthy people. One example, the Epstein donations to Ivy League universities in the US. Uh, but second, also because of another issue that we mentioned earlier, which is that, you know, these elites, through this reputation, through this uh, kind of melting into, uh, into the Western elites, they sometimes even become 
us uh, by their passports as well. You know, the golden visas and the golden passports are that. Um, so once you become a UK citizen, once you, for instance, well, Abramovich is not a UK citizen, if I'm not mistaken, but, you know, Berezovsky was, um, and uh, several other, other, other people who we could, you know, put in, into this remit of problematic peps, uh, politically exposed persons. Uh, so once you become, you know, us, once you become a UK citizen, you're sort of above the scrutiny, whereas this should not be the case. Um, and that's why I think it's very important to put the focus on, on, uh, on how you know, how transnational these issues are and how transparency should be implemented at, at all levels to catch any loopholes. Great, thank you very much, Tana. And, and certainly one area in terms of um, PEPs and employing mechanisms um, to sanction or to scrutinize um, the illicit financial flows, um, it's also been interesting to see um, with previous anti-corruption sanctions in Europe, in North America, in certain other countries, um, the variations in terms of which individuals may be subjected to a particular policy mechanism. So it does seem often that even as we see more transatlantic scrutiny of this issue, more rallying to, Im to implement um, these sorts of policy responses, um, that in terms of their, their application and the selection of which individuals should they apply to, um, there still may be um, lingering loopholes. And perhaps that is also an area for further coordination um, between the civil society and uh, democratically committed communities in, in these countries. Um, Stas, turning, turning back to you, um, as, as we've discussed um, throughout this event thus far, um, there's uh, currently, uh, the focus on Russia and its oligarchs has been dominating the news. But as you've noted, um, kleptocratic, kleptocratic networks also operate at scale outside of Russia um, and have been also evident in Belarus. Um, in the current sort of geopolitical context, could you tell us more about what your investigations have revealed about how Russian and Belarusian kleptocratic systems are intertwined and whether you see opportunities to push back? Uh, well, um, basically, the whole Belarusian economy is uh, more or less uh, the, <clears throat> the the way it is built now is more or less a corrupt scheme uh, rooted uh, rooted in Russia because <clears throat> the way it works is that um, the Kremlin gives uh, the Lukashenko, uh, Lukashenko government uh, subsidies in forms of uh, cheap oil and gas, so that is obviously for uh, political loyalty. But then Lukashenko, through his um, uh, cronies, uh, privatizes part of these. Um, uh, of these subsidies, and then uh, a part of these pr privatized subsidies are being kicked back to Russia to uh, to ensure, uh, if not um, if not necessarily the supported its core, but a lubricant to actually uh, to actually be um, uh, to actually keep that uh, scheme operating and be uh, and be more uh, profitable for uh, for all the parties. So uh, one of the uh, one of the most, uh, one of the biggest examples is, for example, weapons. So, uh, Rosoborona Export supplies Belarus as its ally at uh, discounted prices. Uh, sometimes they just ri write off uh, um, munitions for free and uh, for them to be modernized in Belarus. And uh, <clears throat> then that is being uh, taken up very often in Belarus by a, a private company. Uh, it used to be... Um, uh, Bel uh, Build tech export yeah, because there is a lot of uh, build tech export now it's uh, build speeds near technology they're similar names but uh, yeah so uh, build tech export uh, the one that used to be the biggest like in the end of 90s and uh, 2000s so uh, uh, the uh, Lukashenko's daughter-in-law was employed there the a lot of the current prime minister is coming from there the current uh, chief trader in Potash is uh, coming from there Lukashenko openly said when he was um, when he was appointing him that trading Belarus and Potash is going to be a bit like trading arms nowadays. So uh, this, uh, this is why we're going to need uh, your experience, because obviously the Belarus and Potash is banned by sanctions, but uh, yet sought uh, after for uh, where, uh, where it's not legal to, to buy it. Um, so that's, uh, that's a big scheme. Uh, another big scheme is oil. So uh, uh, the uh, Russian cheap oil used to fool Belarus and um, uh, economic system, which is uh, it's largely state-owned, uh, so Russia would supply 
uh, oil at domestic prices, which at some point used to be half price. Now the, the uh, profit margin is uh, diminishing. And then uh, um, for, for this oil um, to be uh, to be uh, to be uh, refined at state-owned refineries and then exported to the West to um, and then the Belarusian economy would use the profits to subsidize the uh, the state-owned uh, machinery production. So uh, Lukashenko would take uh, a huge chunk, uh, a quarter, uh, a quarter to a third of the, of these uh, of this oil and uh, give it to a private company that would use these same state-owned refineries to refine. Um, and then export them to the West through a number of uh, uh, offshore companies um, for, and, uh, and the money lending in UK. So for example, that was one of our investigations with the OCCRP, this, uh, the, uh, the Ternavsky oligarch in Belarus, who is, by the way, uh, also a Russian national and co connected to a bigger oligarch in Russia, uh, Mikhail Gutseriev, who is also uh, now sanctioned. So uh, they would... Uh, hold this uh, um, this uh, privatized uh, th this wallet where the privatized uh, 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 subsidies would go basically to um, so um, arms petroleum then another scheme is um, uh, for example uh, for internet in Belarus uh, of mobile internet Belarus is uh, uh, unprecedented in, in what it did. It uh, created a, a intermediary company to which it gave the 4G frequencies. And then that company sells it, uh, is the only one who is allowed to build the 4G um, of, uh, receivers and, uh, uh, and uh, resells it to national operators. So that company, uh, hundreds of uh, millions of dollars have been lost on that deal. And the ownership of that company is uh, a state-owned structure, half uh, owned by Lukashenko's son. And another half is a Russian multi-billionaire who is uh, also, uh, whose wife uh, has a company that uh, used to sell uh, weapons to uh, Belarus, Russian-made weapons to Belarus. Uh, the deal was made by Lukashenko's son. So, uh, yeah, you have, um, uh, basically, Belarus is rarely used, as, of, uh, as we can see from what we can see, is rarely used to actually uh, lend uh, Russian oligarchs assets. The Ukrainians do, uh, for example, the Ukrainian pro-Russian politicians, uh, Kozak and Medvedchuk, now uh, they're being sued in Ukraine. So uh, they've been uh, using Belarus uh, both for, uh, for their schemes to avoid sanctions uh, uh, imposed uh, uh, first by Ukraine and now by, well, uh, to, to avoid the Ukrainian sanctions against their Russian uh, assets and, uh, and to hide uh, their assets with, uh, in Belarus. But this is a rare case because Lukashenko is not viewed as a very, uh, as a very um, uh, reliable uh, purse holder. So uh, he, uh, uh, very often you see nationalizations in Belarus and so on. So uh, yeah, Belarus is being uh, very often used as sort of a, a tool to uh, first uh, uh, to first siphon off Russian state money, uh, move it to uh, offshores. And then uh, and and move it to offshores. And then uh, uh, the uh, the spoils are being distributed between both Belarusian and the Russian officials. Thanks very much, Stas. That's a that's a very powerful overview of just how intertwined and interconnected um, the these systems have have become. Um, so I, I do see that Nate has now joined us. Um, welcome, Nate, to to this panel. Um, and perhaps to directly turn to you um, now, we've been discussing in the current political context um, with the rallying and attention that kleptocracy has received since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, um, some of the different aspects that need to be borne in mind as um, transnational collaboration um, in, uh, in responding to kleptocracy, both in this context as well as in other, other regions, um, what, what elements should be borne in mind. Um, and I'd like to turn to you, given your expertise on the US policy response and the kleptocracy initiatives sort of pioneering work in underscoring um, the need and the urgency of tackling the different ways that kleptocratic networks do exploit democratic systems. Um, what is your assessment of the current efforts to tackle kleptocracy on both sides of the Atlantic?
I think you need to unmute. Oh, there, there you we go. go. Sorry, I couldn't unmute. It said I was a. Uh, I didn't have permission. But um, firstly, apologies for joining uh, late. Uh, I, I got the, uh, the 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 transatlantic time difference wrong, uh, as I think many 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 of the meetings uh, have have in the past few weeks between people in the EU and the US. So, so huge apologies for joining uh, late, but thank you so much for giving me the chance to speak, uh, and at such an exciting and important time, uh, for exactly the reasons uh, you, you just uh, introduced, uh, which is the elevated efforts on both sides of the Atlantic uh, to to go after uh, kleptocrats, but also uh, to strengthen. The sort of anti-corruption, anti-money laundering uh, ecosystem more broadly, and so I guess I, I work primarily, as you said, on the U.S. side. So I think, just sort of starting there, it's important to remember that um, I'm never not going to say that you know anything to do with the, the Ukraine uh, war is, is comes at a fortunate time. The whole thing is, is horrific, of course, but we need to remember that um, the the in terms of anti-corruption and being able to target to target Russian, uh, you know, criminal elites. Uh, the U.S. Um, has well, it's always been sort of a, a sort of anti-corruption, anti-money laundering uh, uh, lead, leader when it comes to innovation and enforcement, particularly. But in the past year, President Biden has really elevated the issue of, of countering kleptocracy uh, to uh, quote a core U.S. national security interest. Uh, and in doing so, he he launched um, the most comprehensive anti-corruption strategy uh, the U.S. has ever had, uh, with plans to accelerate. Uh, you know, the, the, the banning of anonymous shell companies, which are, of course, the ubiquitous vehicles for transnational money laundering, uh, plans to, to expand the U.S. anti-money laundering system to, to make sure that it's not just banks that are responsible for reporting suspicious transactions by Russian kleptocrats and, and indeed kleptocrats from anywhere, uh, but, but lawyers, uh, you know, uh, accountants, real estate agents, and everyone uh, who is routinely used and abused uh, by, by transnational money launderers and their, and their, and their customers, the, the kleptocrats. Uh, so it's a really exciting time here uh, in the U.S. for that. Uh, the Congress is on board with this as well. I've got to remember in the U.S., uh, Congress is actually the first branch of government. Uh, and so it's important to keep an eye on what they're doing as, as much as any given administration at any time. Uh, and they launched a, you know, a new a caucus, uh, a bipartisan caucus, which is churning out anti-corruption uh, legislation as, as we speak uh, but, and, and, and is also elevating its efforts in response to, to, the, to the Russian invasion. I think um, the difference between the U.S., and the EU and the UK traditionally has been uh, that the US is, tends to be better about enforcement, uh, uh, where it's, it's sometimes a bit behind uh, with some of uh, the, the legal innovations that are needed, um, but, but specifically on the money laundering front. Uh, whereas the, the EU uh, has, was, has been ahead in recent years in terms of those, those anti-money laundering measures involving transparency, particularly the shell company issue and the breadth of, of the anti-money laundering uh, system. But what they so those systems are already, uh, you know, legally in place across the, the EU, but they've not been very good about enforcing them. Uh, and so when we talk about, uh, you know, um, the ability to root out kleptocrats uh, and their dirty money from across the EU and, and, and the UK, I think what you're seeing is, is, a, is a really elevated effort now uh, to, to go after these assets uh, and put the resources in place and the political will that's needed to do that. Uh, the meeting I just came from, which is why I was, I was late uh, joining today, was with a senior UK official, uh, and it's really encouraging to hear what they're doing behind the scenes, in addition to the steps they've already taken. Uh, and they're here in Washington doing the rounds actively. I know that officials from the U US are over in the EU and the UK as well, uh, sort of meeting on this stuff. How do we how do we improve our, you know, uh, you know, there's a launch of a new uh, task force here in the US uh, to coordinate these efforts. Uh, but that is that is going to be contributing to a, a bigger transatlantic task force. Uh, to go after kleptocrats assets. So I also apologize for repeating anything that everyone, uh, people have already probably talked about. Um, but when we talk about, you know, it takes a network to be the network. Uh, I presume uh, the other panelists have talked a lot about the sort of civil society aspect of it. And that's, that's really important because that's where, uh, you know, all this started, uh, you know, so sort of 2016, the Panama Papers and, and so on, you know, the, the, the investigative journalists and the way the researchers uh, in different countries have been able to work together is, is why we know about this problem at all. Uh, and what you're now seeing is the other side of the coin, which is governments coming together, the ones who can actually sort of, you know, take this information uh, and do something with it. So I think uh, it's a really exciting time to be working on this issue. Uh, just sorry, uh, sorry. The first thing you hear from anyone is, though, we're, we're just so sorry that it had to be the, the, the invasion of Ukraine that brought this about. Thank you very much. I think that some very important points and um, some very helpful insight made into the policy responses um, that are being mounted by democratic states in, in response to these trends. 
Um, we're see, beginning to see questions pouring into the Zoom chat. Um, so please, um, others who are joining virtually, please drop your questions there. Um, I'll start though with, um, with moderators privilege for, for our panelists. Um, we've seen unprecedented action against Russian kleptocrats in the past, um, a little bit over a month since the invasion. Um, but all of the panelists have noted that there is still loopholes that oligarchs can benefit from. Um, and perhaps widening the lens a bit from the sort of um, Ukrainian, Russian, Belarusian space, um, and bearing in mind that there are also assets flowing and from other regions in the world, um, it would be helpful to hear your assessment of whether the current momentum and attention um, to, uh, to the war in Ukraine and sanctioning Russian oligarchs, whether this momentum can be used to change something systemic um, in responding to the problems of um, kleptocratic money laundering um, and reputation laundering and uh, illicit financial flows coming from Africa, from Latin America, from Asia, from, from other regions and countries that have been a bit less in, um, in, in the focus recently. Um, so Nate, if I could turn to you first, um, given your expertise in sort of assessing the policy landscape as well as your discussion with different policy actors. Are you seeing more political will in your conversations with transatlantic policymakers um, that suggests that this may be an opportunity for a landscape shift also more broadly? Can someone unmute Nate, please? Oh, there we go. Sorry about that. Uh, I was trying to unmute myself again. It, some, someone wasn't uh, wasn't letting me speak, which is which is fair enough after I got I got here so late. The short answer is uh, ab absolutely yes. Uh, uh, as 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 I sort of mentioned, you know, you had you had the launch of this huge. It's a thirty-five page strategy here in the U.S. packed with, uh, you know, recommend uh, you know policy commitments by the Biden administration to elevate the fight against corruption. That happened before, uh, you know, the invasion of Ukraine and the particular focus on Russia. So those are all. Uh, you know, prescriptions that are going to contribute to the broader uh, battle against uh, corruption and illicit financial flows from all regions. Uh, and likewise, um, you know, the UK has now uh, accelerated uh, its economic crime bill, which had been dragging its feet on forever, which would do things like create a proper, uh, you know, a register of who really owns uh, all those mansions in London uh, using overseas shell companies, hugely important. It's a huge, it's a huge way that kleptocrats launder their money. Um, the EU likewise um, has a number of things on its on its plate, which are, which are you know are absolutely bound to get accelerated now. One of them, for example, is creating an anti money laundering uh, regulator that covers all EU countries. Right at the moment, they have a very piecemeal system. And of course, the weakest the weakest link in the chain of, of the EU regulatory system is is is, is the common factor. So uh, you know that's really exciting as well. But I think you know that uh, at first I sort of worried about a bit about you know. This whole frenzy of sort of going out after oligarchs yachts and that's what the sort of public thought that you know countering corruption and, and kleptocracy that's that's kind of all it is and that's all it's capable of of achieving you know we impound a yacht it doesn't necessarily topple putin overnight because there's a palace coup because the oligarchs are annoyed about their yachts being seized and then people kind of think it's a fad and moved on but the the real the sort of value again i hate to talk about it in positive terms because the backdrop is is war in ukraine but the positive one of the positive things that's coming from that is that all these things that were uh, in motion anyway because of all the great work that all the sort of civil society groups have done and investigative journalists have done in exposing uh, the threat of, of posed by kleptocracy all these things on both sides of the atlantic that were under underway anyway are now being used by pol politicians are now under pressure to say you know they get asked what are you doing about you know what can we do about russian oligarchs and russian money laundering and they and they and the people in their ministries or their, their departments bring them and say well we already had this underway and they say right accelerate it uh, so that's that's the good thing that's happening, and I think you're going to see a lot, a lot, a lot of those sort of like systemic reforms being rushed through. The, the good example so far, so far, as I said, being the economic crime bill in the UK. Cooper, thanks very much, Nate. Um, Melissa Tenastas, do you have anything to add? No, I mean, I guess I would just add that you know we had a meeting the other day where we heard from an activist. Uh, African activists um, saying how disillusioned they they were in a way because everything that you know the Russians have been doing, um, African kleptocrats have been doing. You know, some of those guys have been in power for 40, 50 years, um, just incredible lengths of time. And you know, there's there there hasn't ever been any kind of sustained 
momentum against them. So I think, you know, it's just my my hope to the universe that this doesn't fade away once Russia is done, um, you know, terrorizing Ukraine, um, and that they they do focus on this as a global issue and not Russia specific. Otherwise, we are going to lose constituencies of of people in, um, you know, places like, you know, parts of Africa and um, parts of Latin America and whatnot, who who sort of get so disillusioned by um, by the fact that they're sort of being overlooked over and over again. Um, you know, we're, we're going to lose those those groups pretty quickly if this isn't translated into something more um, global and long lasting. Yes, Strauss. Yeah, <clears throat> and maybe just to stress the point again that um, from the experience of um, uh, Belarusian sanctioned oligarchs, that the sanctions only really work for a day. Uh, the day that it takes them to go to the notary and uh, re, uh, rewrite the ownership of the structures. So um, of, obviously it's uh, great news that the EU is uh, now introduce, uh, planning to introduce this uh, uh, single anti-laundering body because right now it's, uh, they have uh, FISMA, then they have uh, two, more bodies, uh, two more bodies that are all responsible for sanctions, but in fact, they're not really. Uh, completely responsible for sanctions because this is the uh, of national this is the responsibility of national governments. So there's, uh, there's obviously a weak spot there which uh, uh, which is being imp uh, improved, but uh, the really really weak spot in international sanctions is the very slow response in targeting the uh, family members and the employees and the uh, uh, affiliated persons that uh, the assets are being passed on passed on to. Um, yes, I'm really happy that a truly uh, optimistic person has joined the panel. So thank you, Nate, for, <laughs> for these thoughts. And indeed, it is true that the US has uh, made huge strides lately in uh, in tackling kleptocracy even before this, this crisis. And uh, um, some elements of, of the EU's response have also been very positive, including also, I would say, um, uh, the uh, public prosecutor led by Laura Covesi, which is having great uh, impact in, in some new member states. I think these developments are really important. I would, though, throw some shade on the progress done by the UK again um, because I mean yes the, the, it's good of course that the economic crime bill has been uh, finally pushed through but as I as I mentioned at the beginning this response was very rushed and very ad hoc and very responsive so when we published our report to Chatham House uh, in December the same day Liz Truss uh, the foreign minister of, uh, of the UK has spoken at the same think tank saying that the anti money laundering regime of the UK is world leading so this was five minutes before midnight, midnight being 24th of February, and they even knew it was coming, right? And so even then, uh, you know, they, they, they were not uh, basically, uh, they, we, we didn't see anything like a mea culpa and anything like, uh, you know, okay, let's tackle this problem now. Uh, but instead, you know, again, um, basically sweeping the problem under the carpet and saying we're, we're doing everything we can, which is now very obvious that uh, they have not been doing. And then, I mean, the, the way it's, it has been implemented, as uh, also Stas mentioned, has a lot of loopholes, of, obviously. The positive thing is the, um, the possibility of a second and economic crime bill um, in which uh, you know some of these uh, these issues that are currently very very um, wobbly uh, I hope will be strengthened uh, such as the fact that right now you know you're only kind of have uh, starting to have the possibility to freeze assets which is also a whole issue but not really to seize them and to so asset recovery is a big issue um, the action on enablers more more uh, strongly uh, also is is outstanding uh, there is talk about uh, a, a special economic crime court, which would be really important for one of the reasons I mentioned in my introductory remarks, uh, being the fact that, you know, this issue of the, the wealth that uh, uh, the burden of, on, of proof in the courts of the wealth being lawfully obtained in the UK is still taken as, you know, uh, at face value, what we're receiving from Kazakhstan, from well, let's say Russia from Azerbaijan, etc. So we really need to rethink that. So that's why, you know, a special court will be so important. And of course, investment into crime agencies and, and law enforcement were, that are uh, heavily underfunded at the moment. So um, yeah, so just to throw some um, cautious pessimism into the overall and very welcome optimism that, uh, that has been introduced into this panel. Thank you. 
Thank you. Well, I want to turn to some of the questions that we're seeing come, come in through Zoom. Um, and one of the one of the sets of questions I would say is relating um, looking at the countries where kleptocratic practices are taking place in the first place, as well as in transit countries. So looking at the policy momentum that's been focusing on destination countries um, and sanctioning or blocking or freezing or seizing assets, um, but maybe looking a little bit closer to home um, and in your expert opinions, are there ways in which the global democracy rights and governance community can make systemic changes to nip this problem um, in the origin countries, prevent kleptocratic practices from taking place in the first place? Um, and in addition, have you seen any efforts made by transit countries um, to enforce international standards or good practice in these sorts of money laundering schemes, the, the illicit financial flows that, that transit their jurisdictions? I think um, on the first, yeah, I'll, I'll, take, I'll just take a first stab. The, you know, the first question about what you, as I understand, is what you can sort of do to reach into kleptocratic societies and try and, and try and sort of target the, uh, the kleptocrats themselves there. And, you know, we have powerful tools to try and do that. You know, the, the, here in the US and in many countries now, there's, there are global Magnitsky sanctions programs. Um, but again, I think that a lot of that is about removing the incentives, uh, you know, that we provide by, by providing the money, the transnational money laundering services. So as, as destination and transit countries, uh, you know, the best thing we can do, yes, fine, by all means sanction a corrupt kleptocrat. Uh, but if you're the one who's sort of laundering the money for him, it, it rings it rings a little hollow. So we do have to, we do have to start with that. Uh, and on the second one though, the, the interesting, you know, tra transit countries are kind of the, you know, they're, they're really key here because they're how, you know, um, you know, dirty money is, is moved moved into into destination countries, of course. So if you can if you can sort of break them into into you know uh, better enforcement, better more transparency, that's gonna that's gonna do probably more than anything else to try to try and uh, you know clean up the global financial system. I think like you know, um, and I take all your points from before. I, I am an optimist on this stuff, and I think that you know you need optimists to push governments uh, by by cheering them on as well as uh, you know. Uh, people, people who rightly, rightly criticise them, and I don't want to sugarcoat, you know, the, the, the role that the, the UK has played, both as a transit country and as a destination country. Uh, but, you know, you could equally say the same of, of the US, uh, where I'm, I'm speaking. I've, I've got an English accent, I'm a dual citizen, so I sort of focus on those two countries, but, you know, the EU too. But I think there have been a, there have been a number of positive steps regarding some of the more notorious uh, sort of transit countries recently. Uh, Cyprus used to be you know, it's just, it still is, you know, a wash with, with, with Russian money particularly, uh, and money, dirty money from across the Middle East for that matter. Uh, but they have taken a number of steps to try and strengthen, uh, you know, their regulatory regime in the past few years. They, they have a, a, a register of own, a beneficial ownership now. Uh, it's not perfect or anything like that. Uh, they ban I think at one point they banned, you know, uh, foreigners from, from holding sort of bank deposits there. I mean, as a transit country, ban banning people from holding deposits isn't quite the thing we're sort of worried about. We're worried about you providing the shell companies and the banks that funnel the money through to other places. But these are these are positive steps. And if you talk to people at the Treasury here in the US, uh, you know, uh, similarly, another one I'd flag is pr probably Latvia, uh, which had a tremendous scandal. You know, you'll remember a few years ago, uh, laundering hundreds of billions of dollars through from Russia. Uh, but, um, you know, again, they, they have a really good uh, official in charge the financial intelligence unit has really driven some some key reforms there and then again i wouldn't pretend that things are you know uh you know smelling of roses on, on that front either but but you know there are people working in transit countries uh who are aware of this stuff uh you know uh, to, to try and make things better so um you know there, there are examples out there now of how of how you know you can come back from the brink of being you know you know uh, i mean one country that springs to mind that hasn't done so well on this front for example would be malta which seems the government seems in, incapable of kind of uh, getting its act together on uh, on, on these kinds of reforms, despite, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of like the way that, you know, they've not only, you know, laundered money for, for other countries, but, you know, they're a prime example of how, you know, foreign corrupt money comes to corrupt your own system. Uh, and so, you know, it's, you know, there are, there are people, uh, you know, you have to be sort of careful because, but, you know, there are people who are rightly calling, you know, Malta a nascent kleptocracy itself kind of thing, you know, and, and that's, you know, I think many people in transit countries will be looking at that example and others they will be looking at, you know, they've had their eyes opened by Russia's invasion of Ukraine like we all have and they'll be thinking you know do we really want to carry down this this road of you know economic development through deregulation and you know acting as a magnet for global money launderers uh, so just some thoughts uh, from me uh, I'm sure the others will have uh, more insights <laughs> 
Thank you very much. Um, Stas, Tana, Melissa, anything to add? Well, <clears throat> we've seen um, um, in the West also how banks have become uh, much more, uh, since about 2015, much, much more uh, demanding to uh, to the money coming from uh, exotic locations, which are usually used for offshores. So uh, you see the, uh, the trends uh, in recent years, that they're moving from these uh, uh, offshore uh, island locations uh, back to uh, some of the of Western, uh, uh, <clears throat> Western um, locations uh, for, and uh, to, uh, to run their business from uh, like Cyprus for example is is not considered an offshore uh, an offshore anymore uh, but yeah another point uh, that is uh, probably uh, necessary to <clears throat> to take into, into account that the wealth management companies that actually help hide uh, assets still with uh, all these uh, offshore companies um, that uh, they're um, I think they're not being um, uh, not being uh, punished enough for, for example, for helping to avoid sanctions uh, when when they do. So we've come across in our investigations against uh, um, Mossack Fonseca using um, uh, being used for schemes uh, of, of uh, Belarusian oligarchs. Then um, uh, a big regional company called Lubin, and uh, all of them basically uh, helped avoid sanctions. And then, um, and then they said, "Oh well, we didn't know, but they're not our clients anymore." Basically, and uh, uh, as far as I understand, uh, they weren't really punished for that. So, uh, going after the providers who actually make this happen is also an important step. I think just just to quickly add, um, you know, on, on what to do in the, the source countries, I think, you know, one of the absolute best things that, you know, we can do in the democracies is continue to support and increase support for civil society and, and journalists working in those settings to expose and, and combat kleptocracy. So, you know, that involves anything from just, you know, regular um, grants and whatnot, but also sort of um, getting creative when um, those governments uh, crack down on, you know, foreign funding of, of civil society groups and whatnot, and not just sort of, I remember when when Russia um, started their, their foreign agent law, a lot of the big foundations pulled out, and I, I don't know if that's the right approach, because it can leave um, civil society very high and dry in a time that they, um, you know, need the support more than ever and when they're you know literally putting their life at risk to expose these things so you know funders and western democracies need to get creative and in, in ways to support um those groups so that they can you know um keep people informed and um generate uh demand for for change locally and maybe just to add some very quick comments, because uh, I'm unable to see the whole uh, Q&A uh, chat, but I can see that there is a question about Bosnia at the end, so I feel called to respond. Uh, and <laughs> may I um, actually add some um, cautious optimism in this, in this sense, because in spite of, yes, Bosnia being a very uh, complex country affected by high uh, emigration, in that sense, uh, um, the, the person who has the question is, is right that, you know, the, the capacity of CSU so in, in some ways um, limited. It is also a country that hosts the headquarters of the OCCRP in Sarajevo, that has other amazing uh, investigative journalists such as Tsin, the Center for Investigative Journalism, uh, led by an amazing woman, Leila Bicakcic. And generally, you know, this uh, actually uh, led by amazing woman seems to be a, uh, a constant in, in Bosnia and also in the wider region. So I think this is also an important, uh, important factor, to be honest, that the fight against kleptocracy is uh, is, is also, you know, the, the, the gender dimension is becoming more prominent. But uh, aside from that, um, I would say that uh, there is this great possibility of even in a complex, uh, you know, country with a complex structure such as Bosnia, of uh, creating examples of uh, how uh, transparency and accountability can be increased at the local level. So there are sort of pockets of independence in this moment, also in some um, cantonal, um, especially uh, 
um, um, uh, situations in the in the federation rather than in Republika Srpska, and even in Republika Srpska, in the entity which is more centralized and we can say that uh, operates in a state of state capture, there is a very strong uh, bottom up uh, uh, civil society movement that has been gathered uh, to protest the death of a, of a, of a, um, of a boy, as well as to protest corruption more widely. So my point is that if you know these experiences at at the local level work, this is super important because it gives a message it gives a message to people that um you can you know you there is hope you can actually trust some institutions and changing the tide on this on the lack of trust is fundamental so uh, in another uh, in a in a research we've done with the Balkan senior policy advisory group we found that uh, the faith and belief in elections is at 80 percent in montenegro after a change in regime through elections whereas this is half as high in other countries in the region that didn't have this experience that don't think that this can happen so basically my point is you know planting the seed of trust and of hope is extremely important because it can then be scaled up and I would uh, I would start from there in situations such as Bosnia. Super, thank you all so much. Again, this has been an extremely timely conversation and it's shed light on a number of the trends um, that we've been seeing both in terms of the policy responses and the political will um, to coordinate across uh, regional responses to kleptocracy, as well as some of the lingering needs and priority areas in which civil society, independent media, democratically committed actors um, can cooperate across countries and across regions. Um, I understand that all of the panelists have now arrived for the next panel. Um, so without further ado, I will I once again thank very much um, our speakers on this panel. Um, unfortunately, we couldn't reach all of the questions, but I hope that there will be opportunities to follow up um, later on in the discussion in the event. And I will turn it back over to Egyar and to Joanna Rohoshinska. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Bridget. And thank you to all our panelists for this fascinating discussion. As you noted, our final panelists are here. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Joanna Rohoshinska, who's our program director for Europe uh, based here in Brussels to uh, moderate our final panel, the status of the fight against cryptocracy in Europe. also yell really loud, but I don't think that'll work. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you very much, not only to my colleagues who organized this, but also to the panelists. I am um, honored to be able to moderate such, such a distinguished panel. So I'm going to, because we're running a little bit late, um, I'm going to just go into the introductions for the panelists and then hand it over to them. So to my immediate left, so is a um, member of European Parliament, Daniel Freund. He's the co-chair of the Anti-Corruption Intergroup, member of the Committee on International Trade and European Parliament. Um, he is a member of, of the Green Party, of the German Green Party. His work focuses on transparency, democracy, the fight against corruption, and on the future of the European Union. He is a member of the Constitutional Affairs and Budgetary Control Committees. He leads the, he leads the Green Network on the Conference on the Future of Europe and chairs the European Parliament's Anti-Corruption Intergroup. Before, um, before being elected to the European Parliament, he led Transparency International's work on the EU institutions. His previous work experience includes the German Foreign Ministry, the EU delegation to Hong Kong, Deloitte Consulting, and the French National School of Administration. So. <laughs> uh, he studied politics, economics, and law in Leipzig, Paris, and Washington, and holds a master's degree in public affairs from Sciences Po. Daniel co-founded the European Daily, a platform for news and opinion from a European perspective that was nominated for the Charlemagne Youth Prize. Um, immediately to his left and across from me is Ms. Camino uh, Mortera Martinez, Senior Research Fellow for the Center of European Reform. Uh, she heads the Brussels office of the center um, and works on EU justice and home affairs with particular focus on migration, data protection, internal security, criminal law, police and judicial cooperation. Uh, she also covers Spain's foreign and European policies. Prior to joining the center, she worked on several projects for the European Commission as part of the justice and home affairs teams of a Brussels-based consultancy, um, and was particularly involved in projects dealing with the free movement of persons, criminal and civil law, counterterrorism, police and judicial cooperation, and international private law. Um, she has also worked with a law firm in Spain and at the European Commission in Brussels, as, as well as with an international German companies in 
Berlin, Barcelona, and Brussels. So you prefer the Bs, I see. Um, she's also a lawyer and holds a master's, master's of law from the University of Oviedo um, and an exchange diploma in legal studies with Cardiff University and a master's of arts on EU and political and administrative studies by the College of Europe. Um, you're also, a, she's also a regular contributor to media in Europe and the US and has given evidence to the UK parliament. Um, last and not least, and virtually, so on our screen is Professor Danuta Hubnad, co-chair of the anti-corruption group, member of the subcommittee on tax matters in the European Parliament. Professor Hubner serves as the co-chair of the anti-corruption intergroup and a member of the Committee of, on Economic and Monetary Affairs Europe, in the European Parliament. Um, she is a professor of economics and has been a member of the European Parliament since 2009. Uh, she applies her expertise in economics to her role on the Committee of Economic and Monetary Affairs and the Committee on International Trade. She is also a member of the Delegation for Relations with the US. Previously, she was the Chief Negotiator of Poland's membership in the OECD and Executive Secretary of the Euro uh, European Economic Commission with the rank of Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations. In Poland, she led the Office of the Committee uh, for European integration and was also Minister of European Affairs responsible for Poland for the process of Poland's accession into the European Union. So thank you all for joining us. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to give the introductory questions if you want for, for your remarks. Um, and with the, with the note that unfortunately Mr. Friend is going to have to leave us a little bit early, so I'm going to give him priority. Um, so, Accordingly, you founded the Intergroup Against Corruption in the European Parliament. In your view, is the EU doing enough to prevent kleptocracy in the member states? Well, thanks uh, so much for, for the invitation. Uh, it's good to see the, the Republican Institute on, on this issue. Very, very happy to, to discuss uh, kleptocracy with, with all of you. And indeed, well, uh, Danuta has been, uh, you know, in, in this intergroup as well from, from the beginning that we started basically to bring together members of the European Parliament from different parties, different uh, party families, different countries, because we all believe that uh, to, to fight corruption, to fight kleptocracy, uh, this, uh, well, we all need to fight this together. And this uh, really should not be a political issue. It's um, it's very good to see the U.S. in a way back on 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 these issues uh, because for for four years there uh, we didn't hear that much uh, from from the United States on on many of those questions. Of course, um, you know because the U.S. can be such a strong ally on on all of these questions, and and because sometimes we as Europeans. Uh, lack some of the tools that you guys already have. Uh, well, the NUTA, I and the whole intergroup have started an interparliamentary alliance uh, with members of uh, the US Congress uh, and, and the Senate, uh, also with colleagues from the UK Parliament, uh, where we, you know, not only is this important here in the Parliament to work across political lines, but obviously to coordinate internationally because, uh, well, the the kleptocrats move and their money moves. Uh, so, so we need to coordinate in, in order uh, well, to fight what, what, what they're doing and uh, tracking beneficial ownership or, or cracking down indeed on, on kleptocrats is only something I think that we can really do together and none of us can, can do that alone. In, in terms of where the EU is at, at that, um, I, as I said, I think we're, we're behind on many issues to the US. Uh, we were late on something like uh, Magnitsky and, and still the scope of, of Magnitsky sanctions in the European Union is much more limited. Uh, I think we're, we're, we're seeing now with the sanctions regime uh, after the Russian invasion, in a way, there's we're we're making progress on many of those things. But if you if you look at, for example, how exactly beneficial ownership transparency is implemented at the EU, I think the, the laws are getting better and better. But the implementation and, and actually being able to see who owns what uh, is still largely lacking behind. And I think I mean you can even tell from the difficulties we have at the moment uh, to to seize more than just a couple of of, of yachts in, in European ports. And of course, this, this should be something, the fight against kleptocracy is not just limited uh, to, uh, to Russia, right? Uh, there, there is uh, corruption, there is oligarchic structures, 
uh, way beyond Russia. And actually there is structures inside the European Union. And um, I, I fear that some of these structures have been funded, including by EU funds. Uh, for example, agricultural funds, but EU funds in general uh, are um, too prone uh, to, to fall victim of corruption. And we see, for example, what's going on in Hungary, uh, but also in other member states, uh, former prime minister of the Czech Republic uh, that became a billionaire with EU funds. Um, and uh, there, there has been widespread corruption around him, also manifest conflicts of interest while he was uh, the prime minister of the country then negotiating in Brussels, basically how much money he himself would receive uh, from, from the EU budget. And all of these things, although, you know, it becomes apparent and maybe there is some rules, uh, the, the final consequences of, of actually doing something about it often still, still lag behind and the, the trouble of the European Union uh, to deal with the rule of law, corruption, uh, crises that we have, particularly in Hungary and Poland, is something, uh, well, Danuta and I, but many members of the European Parliament have been working on for years without, as of yet, really being able to, to, to do something about it. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe so far for, for an introduction on, on that question. Thank you. Um, Ms. Matera. In the face of democratic backsliding in many European nations, can you talk a little bit about what the link is between corruption and the rule of law um, and and or democratic backsliding that tends to go with it? This one, yeah. Thanks so much. I um, really have to update that bio to say that um, I basically work on EU crisis uh, one after the other and uh, spend my time on Twitter uh, commenting things with you amongst others. Um, so I do work a lot on the rule of law and corruption as well, so that's why I'm here, I suppose. Um, I had written a huge amount of things about why should we care about corruption, but I'm realizing that this is not the audience to, you know, tell why we should care about corruption. Um, so I'm just going to focus on these uh, introductory remarks. And I'm aware that it's 5 PM, um, so they should be short, um, on the link between um, corruption and the rule of law, uh, which as you know, it's a very big thing for the European Union uh, because of the problems that we have with Hungary, Poland, but as Stalin was mentioning, also with other member states, uh, including Bulgaria, um, Malta, Cyprus, and others that were mentioned before. Um, so um, one of the most serious risks of corruption is that it contributes to the erosion of the rule of law by diminishing trust in institutions and governments. It may, in theory, be possible to have a system which have corruption and a functioning rule of law, although I don't know of any. But in general, the more pervasive the corruption, the more it endangers the rule of law. And I have an example, um, which is very, um, it, it comes very good for me because I'm Spanish. So um, I know everything about uh, corrupted politicians on the coast, um, selling, selling um, you know, hotels and things like that. So we have the Venice Commission and you know, the Venice Commission is the Council of Europe's advisory body on constitutional matters, says that the rule of law has six elements, right? So it's legality, legal certainty, prohibition of arbitrariness, access to justice before independent and impartial courts, respect for human rights, and non-discrimination and equality before the law. So we have uh, corruption that becomes widespread, and it can jeopardize one of several of these elements. For example, imagine a bribe to a local councillor. I have here in Portugal, Salgarve, because I didn't want to single out my country, but let's say in Costa del Sol in Spain, in exchange for a permit to build a hotel in a protected area, I would breach four of those principles. So the first is legality, because the councillor would change the administrative acts, classifying the areas protected, the second is legal certainty, because a protected area where citizens would be able to enjoy uh, nature would disappear. The third is the prohibition of arbitrariness, the councillor is abusing his power, and non-discrimination because the city would only allow companies which pay a fee 
to build hotels and profit from them. So this is a very um, academic way of linking corruption to the rule of law, but it's because I want to avoid um, getting into the political debates, which uh, a lot of the time gets you nowhere. So this is a very sort of like legal or legalistic uh, definition of corruption and the rule of law. And I'm gonna finish my introductory remarks by saying that the pandemic has obviously made things worse as with almost everything else, uh, because corruption cases are indeed increasing everywhere. And um, we are dealing quite daily with corruption here because of the recovery funds, uh, which is an enormous pot of money that was really hard to agree, as Daniel knows, and has been at the center of a number of existential uh, debates about the very future of the European Union. Now, the war in Ukraine has complicated things further. If the European Union agrees, as I think it should, by the way, to a sort of recovery fund 2.0, uh, to manage the economic fall of, of the war, we will have even a, a, an even bigger challenge, sorry, uh, for anti-corruption in Europe. And I'll leave it here for now. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Hubner, as the co-chair of the anti-corruption intergroup of the European Parliament, in your view, are the existing EU mechanisms to fight kleptocracy working? It's not an easy question. I would like to, to avoid also the overlap with what the colleagues said. And, and so let me say the, the following that what is important to see today, because that has impact also on, on our awareness, is that we are living times of growing awareness of the size of money laundering and also kleptocratic expansion. And what, what the, the, the invasion of Putin has shown us is an enormous size also and dynamism of these uh, processes. And we definitely need to, to build institutional capacity to have ways to have means to react also to any reporting and we need also international cooperation and to to many people it comes as a surprise that the eu has adopted its its first uh, anti-money laundering defect uh, directive back in 1990 and since then it has been active in combating financial threats from inside and outside of the uh, of the union but now we have as of last year put on the table the kind of revolutionary anti-money laundering package that the Commission, the European Commission has uh, proposed to improve the, the process of detecting of suspicious transactions and activities and also to close existing loopholes uh, used by criminals to launder illicit uh, proceeds. And the package, uh, which is, I think, very important for Europe, um, addresses the major flaw of the system, as I see it, because we have had uh, so far only uh, at national level, the institutional framework. And now we are establishing the anti money laundry authority at the European level and uh, also enhancing with those new regulations, the cooperation among the national financial intelligence uh, units. And this new regulation also proposes new rules on customer due diligence and also on beneficial ownership, which was already, I think, uh, uh, mentioned. So it is, um, uh, from my point of view, it's also extremely important that we have this piece of legislation as a regulation, because in Europe, those who know Europe know that regulation does not require transposition um, at national level, but is directly implemented. And when we have directives, we, we just have those different um, uh, transpositions, which create exactly those differences, uh, loopholes, and uh, um, give, as, as a result, uh, less efficient protection um, uh, uh, of uh, Europe and its budgets and uh, against the um, kleptocracies and money laundry. Uh, so we also have in Europe, um, I think, uh, a lot of attention being paid, paid to uh, efficient protection of, of the budget of the European uh, union and just week just last week uh, the european parliament adopted a resolution on the current multi-annual budget for 21 27 with a very clear message i think we have never been so clear and uh, also a commitment to fight against oligarch structures and we are talking about the money used mostly within the european union to protect also the funds from fraud and act against the conflict of interest and you must have probably also heard about the, the new regulation that we have uh, of uh, starting with the last year, which is on the rule of law conditionality. And this is a piece of legislation which aims to protect the EU budget against breaches of the principles of the rule uh, of law. 
and the ECJ has just confirmed, I think a month ago, the legality of the regulation because it was questioned by Hungary and Poland and the, the, you, you probably understand um, uh, they were seeking to annul uh, it. So EU legislation is very important, uh, but we also know that we cannot face kleptocratic behaviors alone and we need international cooperation. So we cooperate basically within all the global structures that exist in, in OECD, G7, UN, but we are also uh, engaging with our allies through various organizations like the Financial Action Task Force and what uh, Daniel mentioned also this, this new uh, coalition or alliance between the EU Parliament, the, the Congress and the uh, UK um, uh, all-party parliamentary uh, group. We have also as European Union uh, um, joint financial regulatory forum with, uh, with US uh, where, uh, where you have the European Commission and the Treasury on the other uh, side and in the last meeting in March uh, on the agenda of this uh, joint forum, uh, there was exactly the anti-money laundry issue and also countering financing of, uh, of terrorism. So I think that all these alliances are extremely important because we know very well that money laundry and kleptocratic activities, they do not respect national uh, borders. But of course, we also know that uh, and the union we have, uh, we dedicate a lot of attention, I think, to the fact that we not only need to have rules, and we are building those rules, uh, but we have to have them properly implemented and enforced. And if you look for a major weakness, it's usually in this implementation and enforcement um, stage where, where we have uh, uh, also uh, weaknesses. Uh, and it, it is important because we know that all those autocratic regimes, they are today not just um, old style networks because they are extremely active also in influencing uh, public um, uh, opinion, uh, not only in their own countries, but also around the, the world. And actually, again, the war <coughs> showed us uh, very clearly, we could see the Russian kleptocracy false narrative around the uh, Ukrainian war. Uh, this has become actually a mainstream lie uh, to society in, in, in Russia. And also we, we could uh, see the kleptocratic accolades of Putin uh, attempting to influence our perspective of the atrocities through different media and social media uh, channels. Uh, so that takes me to, to the crucial, I think, importance of the freedom of media and protection of whistleblowers. And we have been also active on this in the European Parliament, uh, especially the, the European Media Freedom Act, a new act uh, was promised and will be hopefully presented by the Commission before the end of this year. But also, I think at the end of 2019, the directive on the legal protection of whistleblower entered also into, into force. And uh, the interesting thing is that the deadline for uh, in, 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 in transposing it to national law was December 21. So it's just, it's already passed. So it will be also interesting for us to, to see how many uh, member states uh, respected really the, um, uh, the date. And just to conclude, let me say uh, just a few words because I, a few issues, uh, because I think they might be important that we know that the world after the war, wherever it finishes, will be different. But we can be sure that the race between democracy and autocracy will be fiercer and more meaningful and will move from mostly technology race to politics. And there will be a lot of efforts to recuperate losses generated by the sanctions thrown boldly also at individual participants of the kleptocratic regime of Putin. And the pre-war kleptocratic elites will come back with new ways of acting, new networks, new appetite for wealth. And there will also be, I think, new kleptocratic elites for post-war because post-war time is usually very conducive to this type of uh, processes. So we need an international strategy, I think, for of fighting uh, them and we have to look also hard at what changes we need to our democratic financial systems in particular so that they cannot be abused and uh, we simply must spare no efforts to impose a zero tolerance for corruption we must also have zero tolerance for business models that allow to steal and laundry and we need total transparency of transactions um, and many other things, because I think we know today better what is at stake, and it is about the future of democracy. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, and I'll point like a nice complementarity to the previous panel that dealt on the civil society side. They use that it takes a network to network to 
be the network. And so you have an alliance to basically do the same thing. So it's nice complementary on the both political and the and the civil end of it. Um, I'll go back to Daniel and be mindful of your time. I'm going to give you two questions in one, including one that came through online. So um, you did talk extensively about the misuse of EU funds. You gave a couple of examples from the Czech Republic and, and Hungary, which are notorious. Um, but I was wondering if you could say, are there any concrete steps that the EU can take to address this misuse within the European Union by European Union actors? The other question I'm going to throw at you, we got online, but I wanted to ask you, because I know that you're going to leave and I find it interesting, is that it's going back to your point about targeting, um, you targeting kleptocratic structures beyond Russia, how should the EU deal with the CCP's role in spreading these structures inside of Europe? Thank you very much. On, on, on the misuse of, of EU funds, I think at this point, it's more a political question whether to use the existing tools than to create additional tools. Uh, Danuta has already mentioned the, the conditionality mechanism that entered into force 15 months ago, and that remains unused to this day. Uh, I have some hope that following the election in Hungary uh, on, on Sunday, that finally the commission will, will overcome its reluctance and, and, and make use of this conditionality that allows to freeze the entirety or up to the entirety of EU funds that a country receives. In the case of, of Hungary, uh, that's 6 billion uh, euros per year. It, I mean, if you look at the share of public investment, so anything from new roads, fast internet lines, new schools, over 90% of public investment in Hungary is co-funded by the European Union. So if that money is gone, that will put a lot of pressure on the Hungarian government to move on the long list of criticism, you know, non-independence of court, complete control over the media, uh, a, a public procurement law that is useless, basically, uh, anti-corruption bodies that don't function. I mean, all of that would move if such a substan substantial amount of money would, would be withheld uh, from, from the country. So I think the tool is there. The question is, is the political will there to, to also use it? Let me say something else. I don't know how familiar all of you are with the way that the European Union actually spends its funding. Because, well, we have an annual budget of, of about 180 billion euros uh, at, at the moment. But this money is not spent in a way by the European Union institutions or the Commission, but this money to 90% to of that money is handed back to the governments and they spend it in a way on behalf of the European Union. So the Union has you know, little control over actually how this money is spent and uh, also prosecuting uh, whenever there is uh, fraud or mismanagement or, or something. You know, the, the idea being that there is working justice systems, there is working prosecutions and, and courts in the member state that will do that on behalf of the European Union, making sure that European taxpayers' money is, is protected. But when you have situations like in Poland, even more so in Hungary, when there is no longer an independent justice, when there is no longer independent prosecutors, uh, and where the government is organizing the stealing of, of EU funds, well, then this system collapses. And I think and the, the, the Nuta mentioned the, the report on oligarchic structures. One of the things that the European Parliament in this report, uh, you know, has taken up from, from what I suggested is that in, in countries where the, the judicial system, the independence of the judiciary is, is so much in question, I would question whether this, this type of shared management actually still works. Um, so, so we need to reflect also on the way uh, that the EU spends its money, but it's more a political question than, than one of, you know, changing, changing the rules at this point. Everything we do um, on, in a way, permitting us to fight uh, oligarchic structures from Russia using our financial system, our real estate market, uh, our economies in general to launder their proceeds, you know, I mean, this is not just targeted at, at, at Russians, you know, and it should help us as well, 
with similar issues, maybe not to the same extent, but that we see in, in a number of countries around the world, including, of course, in, in China. And I think in general, we need to equip the European Union. But, you know, again, I think it's important that, uh, that other, particularly democracies, work with us on this because we're, again, we're stronger when, when we are together on these things and we can shield a large share of the world economy, of the world financial systems from, you know, not only oligarchs, it will help as well with organized crime, with uh, terrorism financing, everyone in a way that that uses or misuses uh, our our economies our financial systems and i think you know i mean we're less looking at, at terrorism than we did uh, 10 10 years ago now it's all about russia but the the things that need to be done in a way beneficial ownership transparency uh, the the resources to track whenever uh, suspicious transfers are, are being made this just needs a certain amount of of, of manual labor in a way uh, to to then follow up on these transactions, look at what it is actually, and then if 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 uh, the suspicion is confirmed, to do something about it. And and I think in 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 a way the frustration that I have seen, including on the fight against corruption, is that we're, we're too slow. I mean, uh, Danuta mentioned you know starting on anti money laundering in the in the early nineties, where we're now at the fifth package inside the European Union, and it's good, and there's progress every time. I just fear that for the moment, uh, those very smart lawyers and very smart accountants that oligarchs and big cartels and, and whatever pay themselves, and also, by the way, large international companies that don't want to pay any taxes, you know, they're faster than we are in, in finding workarounds uh, to, to, to the legal structure. So, Two things, better international cooperation and getting quicker uh, so, so that all those misusing the system don't get away with it just uh, as easily as they have in the past. Can I ask your final word, because I know that you have to go, to what degree does the situation in Ukraine change your calculations on some of these things? I think much of that is, is, is still up. Uh, for for debate, um, I think that it greatly accelerates the the action and debates at the moment on on sort of oligarchs and confiscating stolen stolen assets and and things like that. On on the rule of law question inside the European Union, I fear that for the moment that is more a victim of uh, of of the war in Ukraine, uh, and that the attention is elsewhere, and that. Wrongly, I think uh, some people uh, say now now we need to to be united and and, and not criticize uh, the shortcomings on, on on rule of law inside the European Union anywhere uh, anymore. Whereas I think the, the the Putin playbook hasn't only been used in Russia; it has been used in countries inside the European Union. Uh, so we we need to fight it where, wherever it occurs. And while Ukrainians are fighting and dying for democracy, rule of law, and a prospect inside the European Union, sending them the message that we are now turning a blind eye to, to rule of law violations inside the European Union, I think is a horrible signal uh, to send, including to our friends in, in Ukraine. Thank you very much, and thank you for your time. Um, Ms. Montero Martinez. So your recent research has focused on how the post-pandemic recovery fund could be abused to enable corrupt politicians and kleptocrats. Can you walk us through some of the strategies that you outlined to mitigate this? Yeah, so I am realizing that I have a Zoom acquire um, thingy, which consists on reading my notes, uh, which works much better when you're in front of a camera because nobody sees you reading the notes. Uh, so I think I'm going to dispose of my notes completely. And I'm just going to take it um, from where Daniel left it. Um, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the recovery funds uh, for two things, because it enables transfers between member states. And that's important uh, for us here in Brussels, uh, for those of us who believe in a uh, fiscal union, um, because um, it's sort of like, it's a burden sharing in a way that we haven't seen before. This is not about countries helping, uh, you know, bailing out all the countries, but it's about everybody sort of like absorbing asymmetric risks. 
um, coming from an, an external shock. Uh, so that's sort of the economic governance uh, part of the thing. And the second thing is because the way the recovery fund is designed, it has such a stringent monitoring um, procedure that you're able to actually stop paying countries if you are not sure as the European Commission uh, that they are not auditing uh, the money correctly. And that I think is, a, and this I know that Daniel disagrees with me in here, I think is a much stronger way of bringing countries like Hungary and Poland uh, into account than the conditionality mechanism itself. And there's a reason for that. The conditionality mechanism has been loaded. And if you read superficial accounts of it, you might think that it's a law that allows the European Union to say, you're, you know, you're abusing the rule of law or your judiciary is not independent, I'm going, I'm going to stop giving you money. And that's not the case. This is a very technical law, which is very good. I mean, I'm, I think it's, it's a very good tool. Um, but it, it only allows the Commission or the European Union to stop funding countries if they are using EU money to you know, abuse the rule of law or EU values. So that's a much more limited use than the one you have if you implement the recovery funds sort of monitoring mechanism to everything that you will adopt from now on. So I wish that in the same way that you know, we're opening a debate on whether or not we need to advance on, uh, on fiscal rules and these kind of things that we have suspended in the stability and growth pact, that we are now in a second um, consecutive crisis um, in, in the span of three years that has made us realize that we need better rules to actually absorb these, these shocks. We will also open a debate on whether or not we should be using that kind of monitoring system in in the overall in the overarching EU budget and also using some better um, techniques to monitor and to sort of accompany countries on their way you know from when they join to when they have a seat in the council of ministers because there is something uh, very paradoxic on the fact that there are so many requirements for a country to join the European Union. And we're seeing this with the debate on Ukrainian um, joining uh, the, the EU in terms of rule of law as well and complying with all the key and whatever you want. And this works very well until you get a seat in the Council of Ministers and then you start veto things. So then you get, a, get out of jail free pass. And that I think is unacceptable. So we need to do better as the European Union to prevent countries from getting into that paradoxical thing in which Poland is advocating for Ukraine to join the EU, while Poland is actually not complying with rule of law um, requirements. And the Ukrainians, as Daniel was saying, were are actually dying uh, for, for, for the rule of law. So I think that's something that we could do better and we should do better. Um, Professor Hogner, you kind of alluded to this in your opening comments, but I'll come back to it, that we all know that the European Union is not monolithic. It is made up of different member states with their own individual interests. But I wanted to tease out a little bit, how do you feel or how do you think that disagreements among the individual member states impact the EU's ability to prevent and counter kleptocracy specifically? Uh, well, thank you uh, very much. Uh, indeed, is is one of the issues that is not only related to kleptocracy. We have in the European Union uh, as many competences given to the European level as the member states decide. That's what the treaty says, and it, it it is not that every competence is there. And then for the competences which are for the issues important for the European Union for the functioning of the European Union, which are not the competence of the European Union, meaning involving Commission, European Parliament, and the Euro Council ministers from the national member states as also co-legislators. Uh, for the rest, we have usually the coordination of what member states are doing. And this is where uh, our impact as the European Union in terms of institutions um, is, is, is just uh, limited. And one of the examples is, for example, which is easy, I think, to understand for people from abroad, was exactly the anti manner laundry law, which we had for many years and many generations of this directive. Uh, but it was always uh, without any authority at European level that 
that could uh, coordinate and control and take into account the links between member states, because we know that uh, kleptocracy is money laundering and all those criminal activities, uh, they are not really respecting the uh, the borders, and especially uh, when you have also, for example, programs financed by the European Union, which cover many countries. So that's why now, finally, we can overcome this uh, um, problem with member states not seeing uh, that it is in their interest to pursue some um, uh, investigations. Uh, we can overcome it. Uh, we will be able to overcome it once we finalize the negotiations on the new regulation, because we will have uh, the, the European um, uh, authority. But we also have to, to maybe add to, to this the, the landscape, to this picture of, of Europe, also the fact that we already have, it's not probably it's for two years now, that we have also the um, European Public Prosecutor Office and a, a European Public Prosecutor, uh, which is uh, actually conducts all the criminal investigations uh, in, in this in the area of the budget uh, uh, related issues and also prosecutes cases which are uh, falling under its competence in, in front of national courts. And interestingly enough, uh, not all of member states have joined this, this, this office. So we still have five member states. Uh, you would be surprised probably to hear that it's Denmark, Sweden, Ireland, and Hungary and Poland, which is not coming as a surprise probably. So uh, um, th that's um, also the, the additional issue when it comes to the um, individual uh, states' actions that they don't have. Uh, we have this differentiated integration possibility that you can have an opt-out. Uh, for example, Denmark has a lot of opt-outs related to those home affairs. Um, uh, so uh, th that's a, a problem in the European uh, Union, um, but, but we but that's the reality which we have to cope with. That's why we have to have also mechanism of really monitoring and of bringing things to what we call OLAF, because that's another institution which was not mentioned, which is a, an institutional framework that is conducting, uh, conducting also administrative investigations on crimes committed against budget, uh, but with all the powers of kind of police. And uh, so OLAF is, is also very, uh, very active and it's complementing what the prosecutor is, is doing. But also uh, we, we have the uh, other mechanism, which also this environment created. We have, for example, transparency register where we have all the lobbyists and we as European parliamentarians and also the um, European commissioners, we have to um, uh, make it public whom we meet, uh, uh, with whom we meet in, in the context of uh, legislation. We have code of conduct for MEPs, we have, uh, which is members of European Parliament, we have code of conduct for commissioners as well. So there are additional um, elements of this environment that is sort of strengthening, I think, the final uh, effect. But, but definitely, we, uh, if I can say that thanks to this terrible invasion of Putin, we have this sort of probably will have more open our minds towards uh, uh, thinking about the, the solutions that would be more effective in, when it comes to kleptocratic uh, traditions or um, actions and money laundry and all other criminal um, uh, procedures that might have might take uh, place. Thank you very much. So if anybody has questions or if there's any questions online, I think that we can open it to general questions. Sam? Thank you so much. So um, as we we're discussing about EU conditionality and um, and about uh, even EU enlargement at a certain point with uh, with Ukraine, um, I, I thought, you know, it's it's probably important also to mention the EU accession countries in this context. So something that was not mentioned is the opportunity for the European Parliament to look into EPA funding, uh, the, the funding given to EU accession countries. Um, that is uh, currently, I would say, also something that is uh, underused and underexplored. Um, so the European Parliament has this, uh, uh, this possibility of, of checking uh, the budget in accession countries. So it's uh, just a level 
leverage and extra leverage. And also at the same time, I thought um, it's, you know, linking it to the discussion of not only fighting against kleptocracy, but also fighting for our values and fighting for democracy in this moment. Um, I reckon it's really important to uh, sort of highlight this issue with EU enlargement that has been, uh, you know, marrying the EU for a long time, which is that uh, um, it is not clear that the EU is giving the right rewards for the progress done. So, for instance, you know, some issues that are front and center in, uh, in terms of um, um, the problems of EU enlargement is the fact that Kosovo has uh, um, ticked all the boxes to get visa liberalization and it was not uh, still um, given by the EU, by the EU countries. Um, another issue is the fact that North Macedonia and Albania have not opened their, um, their accession uh, talks uh, uh, due to the blocking, first of Greece for North Macedonia, now of Bulgaria. So all these issues, I think, really weaken the leverage that the EU has in, um, in showing that, you know, me if meaningful progress is done, including in the rule of law, there will be a reward down down the road so i think you know sort of just to throw this into into the discussion this issue of uh, of your enlargement of the countries that were already there that have been in this process for a very long time um uh, because i think it's really important you know if we want to give a signal to countries like ukraine or 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 to other countries indeed that the eu is a family that sticks to its values it's really important to first stick to them in um, with the group of countries that already is uh, in this process and in this sense i just wanted to gauge the opinions of uh, of the panelists on um, the possibility of uh, uh, what, what do you think, what do you sense are the um, appetites in the EU among, uh, uh, you know, EU countries and, uh, and EU institutions more widely to give a strong signal of the possibility of EU enlargement um, if Montenegro, which is among the two front runners, also the country that has some potential to do meaningful um, progress in terms of the fight against rule of law, if it delivers on it. So do you think this would be, you know, this would be a, a message that um, that could be sent? Thank you. I mean, yeah, I, I can just give you a very quick um, opinion on what the accession enlargement debate uh, stands uh, at, at the moment. If you had asked me a uh, a month and a half ago, I would have told you uh, there's no way uh, the EU uh, gets a new member uh, within the next five to 10 years. Uh, the case of Montenegro, uh, it's, uh, it's a special one, but especially in North Macedonia, uh, which actually gave up its official name uh, to get into the EU and is still waiting. Um, however, I think the, the Putin's invasion of Ukraine has changed the debate at the moment. Whereas I do think that um, it's going to be difficult to, to get Ukraine or any other uh, of the candidate members joining the European Union anytime soon, and not least because of the fears that governments uh, like the Polish one or the Hungarian one have sparked on, you know, uh, whether or not countries are ready uh, to be part of a club uh, and, and comply with the rules. I do think that there are many other ways of uh, making it clear that uh, these countries belong to the European family, as you say, and these are by um, sort of associating them to several uh, different uh, structures that we can have, uh, be it, uh, you know, as part of special uh, defense arrangements, special uh, visa arrangements or others. I do think that that's probably in the, in the near future of the European Union. So unfortunately, it seems that we lost our other panelists somewhere in the ether, which is too bad because she actually had a specific question about um, about her opinion, how the US and EU could better collaborate on the issue of kleptocracy. Um, but, but we'll leave that hanging. So if there's any other further questions to our lone final panelist, and if not, then we'll wrap up. No. Can I just use the fact that I'm a lone final panelist? Um, to say a word about the EPPO and how important this has been for the European Union, uh, because the European Union does not have um, competences on criminal matters. So just having a, a centralized body with criminal with competences to prosecute uh, criminals, um, it's an amazing leap forward. I think there are two ways that we can use the EPPO to sort of like 
advance on this uh, fighting corruption and, and, and sort of enhancing uh, the rule of law. So the first one, it's a bit of a techie thing, um, but because we have a number of countries which are not part of the EPPO, um, we could do something called European investigation orders. And that's a decision by the judiciary of one country uh, towards the judiciary of another country asking to gather um, information or use evidence in criminal uh, proceedings. And these European investigation orders actually apply to all EU members except for Denmark and Ireland because they have an opt-out on just a home affairs. So in principle, uh, because the EPPO is a judicial authority, it could actually issue these kind of uh, decisions to initiate investigations in Hungary and Poland. So that's the first way. And the second way is much less techy and is basically that eventually I think we should make it a condition uh, to disperse EU funds in general um, for all EU member states to be part of the EPPO. It doesn't make any sense uh, for the European Union to have a body in charge of prosecuting people misusing or criminally misusing EU funds and then have member states which are not part of it. And by the way, Sweden um, is going to join. So it's just a question of uh, complicated legislation uh, and constitutional tricks that they have to do. I'm hoping that Denmark, since it's changing its position on defense, might change uh, some of its position on just a home affairs as well. And then Hungary and Poland um, are a different question for another debate. So thank you very much. And I will thank our lone panelist and in absentia to the other ones who, who participated as long as they could. Um, and to all of you for your attention, including people who came in at the last hour. So, and I hand it over to my colleague, Agar. Thank you, Joanna. And thanks again to all our panelists. By the way, in case uh, those here are wondering, uh, the Zoom's still on. We just can't see uh, people on the screen anymore, but um, we trust that they can see us and hear us. Um, we've reached the end of our program, so to uh, formally close us out, I'm going to hand the mic to Scott Mastic for uh, the introduction of our final speaker. Okay, so thank you again to all of our panelists today. Uh, I have the great pleasure now of introducing our last speaker of the day, who is Antonio Lopez Estores White. Um, for two decades, um, he has held the office of Secretary General of the European People's Party. Uh, and has also been a member of the European Parliament representing the Spanish Party Popular. Uh, he is the chairman of the Delegation for Relations with Israel of the European Parliament's Committee on Foreign Affairs. In 2013, he received uh, the MEP of the Year Award uh, from the Spanish Parliamentarian Journalists Association. Uh, he is also the Secretary Treasurer of the Wilf Wilford Martin Center for European Studies and Secretary General of the Centrist Democratic and Democrat, sorry, Democrat, not Democratic, Democrat. Usually we say Democratic, and so, anyway. <laughs> uh, he is also, and very importantly for IRI, a terrific friend of the Institute. Uh, we have had great pleasure working with him over the years uh, and uh, really appreciate uh, the partnership we have able to, been able to cultivate with him and the EPP. So um, the floor is yours, sir. Uh, thank you very much for joining us here today. Thank you very much. Scott Mastic, Mastic. Yeah, you see, you say, well, Lopez Historiz, which is not easy. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, I would like to, through you, tell you how happy I am and to tell all my friends in the Republican Institute that uh, to have a, a presential meeting with all of you, uh, well, hybrid, but uh, for the first time now together, I'm um, my chief of cabinet, Luis, just told me that we have plans maybe to be in July in Washington, and I was I was so happy because it's been three years, ladies and gentlemen, that we have lost contact, not through telematic mode, but not presentially. And good friends, uh, we have to be now more than ever in contact. It's not only about Ukraine that I will refer to, it's also about many common places, worries that we have in Africa, in the Middle East, Latin America, uh, Asia, uh, so many things uh, that uh, need our attention uh, from the RBI, from the EPP, 
And uh, let's face it, from those of us, not only DBB, also others in the European Parliament that uh, we share the defense of our democracy, uh, that it is my belief that we have to work together. Um, I, uh, I think that uh, now more than ever with Russia's unprovoked and barbarous aggression against Ukraine, the whole world is seeing what an unchecked and an institutional kleptocracy can lead to. I believe I speak for everyone here when I say that our thoughts and prayers are with the Ukrainian people. And indeed, more than our thoughts and prayers only, our concrete assistance. With loans and grants from the EU alone totaling more than 17 million billion euros since 2014 and 1 billion euros only in military aid since the war began. But that's not enough. The European Union, the United States, NATO, and many allies and partners around the world stand firm with Ukraine. All of us, we are admiring their courage and tenacity. And uh, it is times like this too, that we come to value even more the work of organizations like the RBI, with whom we have worked together for years to defend and promote these democratic values that sometimes we gave for granted. Friends, uh, let's us be real. We are witnessing not only the battle for a free, sovereign and democratic Ukraine, but the struggle for democracy and human rights and rule of law against the forces of authoritarianism. Between our Christian democratic, conservative and liberal values of individual freedom and the false attraction of a strong man. It is a fight that has been occurring under our very noses for some time and in every corner of the world. Russia, Belarus, Venezuela, Cuba, Iran, China, and many others. My political family and I, we know which side we are on. Certain political groups remain suspiciously silent, especially in the left that you know that they still believe that Russia is communist, you know, and all these kind of things. Others remain publicly and shamelessly funded by the Kremlin. This is why democratic allies must, must stand up and be counted. The transatlantic partnership must lead this effort. It must champion the cause of democracy and civil liberties, not just in our societies, but throughout the world. Indeed, we have a moral obligation to help those who fight for democracy wherever they are. The late great Senator John McCain was known for saying, the wall is on fire. So what are we doing about it? Not only that, I was just remembering with Scott, my meetings with late also president of the EPP, Bilfred Martins years ago, when we started this wonderful uh, story between the IRI and the EPP, while Martins and McCain were discussing always one of the topics of their agenda discussions was always Ukraine. And this was 15 years ago. State people, visionaries that unfortunately we lack today with leadership that saw that the problem in Europe will start, could start through Ukraine. Uh, my friends, I look at the state of the world today and the rise of authoritarian societies, and I cannot help but wonder where we are failing. Thugs like Putin think the rules do not apply to them. They think they can kill their opponents on our soil, that they can interfere in our democratic elections, that they can invade sovereign countries, all without any consequence. This horrible war that has gripped our continent is the absolute proof. But it can also be our wake-up call to start taking this threat seriously. 
This is where the main idea of this conference becomes extremely important. We must meet the authoritarian challenge outside our borders, but also inside of them. Our economies cannot be the place where these autocrats and their enables, enablers launder their money. Kleptocracy is essentially about gaming the system. It means using an earned wealth and status to crush competition and steal wealth. We do not have to look too far for clear examples. We know enablers of Putin, Putin are buying huge amounts of property in Europe in order to launder their money. Transparency International Russia found that in the years 2008 to 20, current and former Russian officials have had 28,000 properties in 85 countries, including EU member states. We also know the international dimension that the kleptocracy can take by allowing this authoritarian to bypass the sanctions imposed against them. We know that Maduro withdrew gold bars in 2019 from the Central Bank of Venezuela, sent them to Uganda to be smelted into a new form, sold them and then sent to profits to Iran. This allowed Maduro to have access to cash. It also allowed Iran to have access to cheap gold, which it then used to finance its proxy groups to prop up its regime and destabilize the Middle East. Besides its geopolitical dimension, kleptocracy goes fundamentally against the core values of our transatlantic partnership. Both our continents know the cost in blood of this kind of abuse of power. Our forebears have sacrificed in creating societies built on freedom, prosperity, and peace. So the fight against kleptocracy is our own. There will be, ladies and gentlemen, mark my words, powerful interests and obstacles along our way, but we must persevere. European and American lawmakers working to untangle the complex web of such corruption should take inspiration from the only major political figure who has both constantly and successfully, and yet an enormous, enormous personal cost, fought against kleptocracy in his own home country of Russia, Alexei Navalny. Alexei, through his viral videos, has exposed the contrast between the tiny numbers of winners in the kleptocratic economy and the immense number of losers. Putin and his oligarchs preside over a ruinous and now ruined economy based on lies, embezzlement and intimidation. They sit on mansions and own properties throughout the world, whilst the average lifespan of Russian man is no less than less than 66 years. Let me finish with a word of caution. As we have seen, kleptocracies do not operate in a vacuum. They are operative in our economies too. As in nature, they creep into empty space like water in a swamp, corrupting our societies. As Anne Applebaum said, if democratic societies do not wake up to the spread of corruption among self-interested rulers and their enablers, they might find themselves not only broke and impoverished, but voiceless and unfree. This is a work, ladies and gentlemen, that we have to do together. I think that parties, think tanks from our political spectrum we have for once and all worked together, not only to defend democracy, but our idea of democracy, which is very different from others. I feel it every day in the European Parliament. I have feel this through 20 years as member also of the European Parliament. How many, how many times in resolutions the left boycotted under ministered resolutions where we were trying to condemn these kind of things that now 
now are happening. So we have a lot of work to do ahead of us. And um, I know that the REI and DBB and the Martin Center, we have a common stand and common areas of interest. In July, I think that I will have the privilege to share my thoughts with everybody, uh, with all of you there in Washington and see if we can start immediately um, coordination, <laughs> unifying factor, having all of us integrated in order to fight for our com common values. Now it's time for action. No more words. This is very un-European. Uh, <laughs> it's going to be difficult. It's very, very American and not so European, but it's time for action. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. I think this was uh, the discussions you held are very interesting for all of us and um, are creating the atmosphere that has to lead for this common work. Thank you very much. So let, let me just close in saying thank you uh, very much for those really powerful remarks. I think the call for action is clear. Uh, this uh, event today hopefully is the launch with the, with the playbook of uh, a number of follow-on efforts that IRI will undertake, uh, including and especially here with European partners uh, to combat this issue in the world that we now very starkly live in, which is one where our democracies are confronted by authoritarian aggressors. So thank you. Thank you to the panelists and for all of you joining us virtually. And to those here in Brussels, thank you for attending today. Have a good day.